Good morning to all of you. I'm very pleased to be at the uh, financial reporting event uh, because we are a bit uh, drawn under by what we do in the sustainability area. So it's very important that we are here on financial reporting. My name is uh, Saskia Slump. I'm the CEO of EFRAG. And I'm very pleased to introduce this joint online roundtable together with the IASB under the title, What are the implications of the recent ISB decisions on primary financial statements? We are very delighted to see that 222 people have registered. Now, they will not be all here, but that means that also they will listen to the um, roundtable afterwards because they can also listen to the recording. So the purpose of today is that uh, we discuss basically um, the, uh, the tentative decisions of the ISP and to see if the ISP has achieved indeed the intended balance of cost and benefits. We want to collect the input of the audience. Uh, we have also a wide range of uh, speakers here, as you know from the program, so they will give their input as well. That is very helpful to us, but we uh, want also to have the input of the audience. And to do so, we have actually two means. We have questions that you can just type in at the bottom, and that will be brought uh, to the panels and to the to the speakers. And then um, you can also uh, participate in these polling questions, which would be very helpful as well if you can if you can if you refuse to us there as well now you know of course a primary financial statement is a topic very important to all of us we are discussing that for many many years and you will get a proper introduction by my colleague uh, Catherine and Philippe uh, but also being myself regularly involved in all the user events uh, I know that this is a, a topic very close to the heart of uh, all the users so it's really essential that we make good progress on that and that uh, the outcome will be what all stakeholders decide. So your feedback is really important. So for me, I want to introduce the, the people and the, and the program. So after this introduction, you will have two presentations, one by Nick Anderson, ISB member, and I think he is supported by uh, Nick Barlow from the ISB staff. And then from our side, we have Katrin Schöner, EFRA project director, and she is supported by Philippe Alves, he's our senior technical manager, and he will give some insight on the feedback that we received. And then we have a panel discussion by uh, moderated by Jens Berger. Jens is the vice chair of our financial reporting tech, so he will introduce all the panelists that he has, and he has a six panelists, so it's very important, and we are very pleased to see that we have a number of users uh, in that panel, so that will be a very good discussion between the preparers and the panelists and the uh, users. Sorry. And then we have Carmen Barasa. She is an EFRAC financial reporting tech member, and she will give uh, the conclusions, the takeaways, and her messages uh, for you. So I think with that, um, so this will please uh, complete the polling questions when they appear on your screen and type in any questions you have for anybody and we will see when we can address them. So with that, uh, Nick, I'm going to hand over to you for your introduction on the where we are on this project on primary financial statements. Great. Thank you, Saskia. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my thanks also to EFRAG for their assistance in organising today's events and, of course, to today's panellists. Um, You'll see, I think, in a couple of slides time, we have a timeline which shows that the ISB has been discussing the feedback that it received on its proposals, uh, which were included in the primary financial statements exposure draft. They've been discussing those. We've been discussing those through 2021 into 2022. Today, what we want to hear is your views on the matters where the board has tentatively agreed to change the ED proposals. And the purpose is to help the ISB understand whether we struck the right balance in terms of costs and benefits uh, in relation to those modifiers, those change proposals. Um, you'll recall that there are three main areas uh, in the uh, of proposals in the ED, bringing more structure to the statement of profit or loss, uh, improving uh, disclosures around management performance measures, and strengthening requirements for disaggregating information. So across those three areas, 
there have been some proposed changes that we will be discussing today. So what happens next? Well, um, we've uh, been involved in many events like this around the world. And uh, in a few weeks time, the PFS team, our PFS team will analyze all of the input we have received from those events and this, including this event as the board seeks to finalize the proposals in the primary financial statements project. The board is yet to discuss transition and the effective date for the standard. And also as it comes towards the end of uh, its re-deliberations, it will discuss as part of its due process, will we need to re-expose um, in any way our proposals. Um, important element of the outreach and the events such as this is that will help us with that decision in terms of, again, understanding whether we have struck the right balance of benefits and costs from our proposals. So with that, I will now pass on to Catherine, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so, um, EFRAC outreach activities, I would like to uh, introduce uh, first. EFRAC worked closely with the national standard setters uh, in Europe and with the ISB to assess whether the uh, selected tentative decisions will um, function as intended and uh, achieve the intended um, balance of costs and benefits. It's really important uh, to have that in mind that uh, it's uh, some of the decisions made are reflecting a compromise. And, and um, so the user uh, should benefit from the information, but it should uh, be the right balance of costs as well for the preparers. So um, this outreach as well um, will support the FRAX potential endorsement device. So when the um, IFS accounting standard is published uh, sometime, maybe 20, 2024, we will um, assess uh, the endorsement criteria. And for this, we will use what we have heard during this outreach. So we organized uh, several events to um, get feedback from preparers, from users, uh, from the regulator. And we had organized two round tables with corporates, uh, one round table with financial institutions. We have discussed it with the FRAC working groups. There we have a financial instruments working group, an insurance accounting working group, a rate regulated working group, and a user panel as well. So it's uh, discussed with um, all these different uh, groups. And we have as well participated and uh, in events by the, organized by the National Standard Setters, we, uh, as well as in some of them, or one of them, we um, had a joint meeting and others we participated. So, um, and then we have the event today. What do we do with this feedback? We will uh, summarize the feedback that we have heard and um, discuss in EFRAC Tech in December and in, with EFRAC FRB um, potential ways forward. So we would like to go a, a further step forward and uh, try to, to give recommendation to the ISB um, so that they can complete uh, the, the deliberations on the topics. The topics selected for the outreach um, um, included some of the or some topics in addition compared to what the ISB uh, intended uh, to, to, to discuss with the, um, um, yeah, uh, during the targeted outreach. So we uh, identified during our um, comment period for the exposure draft certain topics that are, might be um, especially discussed in Europe. So, and therefore we included them as well in the targeted outreach. We had there, in addition, uh, identified the classification of items in the financing category, including the classification um, of hybrid contracts with um, host liabilities and embedded derivatives. Uh, we had discussed this already in the um, a comment letter, and we um, discussed it as well on, on the roundtables organized by us. Um, the uh, derivatives and hedging instruments classification was discussed. So um, 
and the uh, classification of income in expenses from subsidiaries, associates, and joint ventures. Uh, I think that will be as well one of the hot topics during our um, today's discussions. In relation to MPMs, we had heard that uh, the balance sheet um, um, items uh, should be included as well and ratios. And so uh, some of the topics related to MPMs are already addressed by the targeted outreach by the ISB, but we had um, in, um, decided to, to, to um, discuss a bit more in detail some of the topics. So um, with that, I would uh, like to hand over to Jens again shortly to introduce his panelists. Thank you, Katrin, and uh, welcome um, everyone on this, this webinar. Um, I have the pleasure and the honor to, to have a very distinct panel of, uh, of uh, participants today in my panel. Um, I'll start in alphabetical order um, with Martijn Boss, who is a um, advisor, a policy advisor at Oymedion, which is uh, representing institutional investors in the Netherlands. Um, we have Andreas Gattung, who is head of the accounting principles department at Volkswagen Group. Um, Niklas Grip, who is a senior vice president and head of regulatory strategies um, at Svenska Handelsbanken. Um, Marisa Maso Fajardo, who is the Deputy Head of Research at GVC Gasco. Um, Luca Di Nofrio, who is um, a, uh, on the Commission on Financial Reporting um, of the European Financial Analysts Association. And Maciej Tuszkiewicz, who is the Chief Accountant and Finance Manager at uh, Welding Alloys in Poland. So welcome all of you and thank you for your contributions today. And with that, um, we um, move directly to our first topic, which is the subtotals um, on the, in the finance category and other proposals on entities with a specified business model. Um, before that, we will use uh, we will use polling questions throughout the uh, the discussion, and so please participate um, if if at all possible um, using your uh, preferred device. And with that, we'll come. Um, I'll hand over to to Nick and Felipe, who will briefly introduce the. Uh, the, the topic number one, which is the subtotals and categories. Great, well, I'll kick off and just give an introduction here to the categories and subtotals for discussion, and then uh, Felipe will give us a bit of a summary of what we've heard so far. Uh, so, so to set the context for these questions, I, uh, as I say, I'll just give a brief reminder of the of the statement of profit or loss uh, proposed in the project, and pointing out some of the key changes from what we proposed in the exposure draft. So, if we can maybe jump right away to slide 14, as this gives a good example of the proposed structure, uh, which includes the subtotals of operating profit and the profit before uh, before the profit before financing and income tax, and shows the three categories that we have here: operating, investing, and financing. So the first, the operating category remains as was proposed in the exposure draft. So that's as a residual category, which captures the income and expenses that are not defined in the other categories. Uh, that ends up with a subtotal required of operating profit, followed by the category of investing. So uh, the investing category had two significant changes from, from the exposure draft. Um, and, and first, the, the category will include income and expenses from associates and joint ventures accounted for using the equity method, and income and expenses from assets that generate returns individually and largely independently of other resources of the entity. And this will include cash and cash equivalents. So the two key changes are, are first, uh, the withdrawal of a distinction between integral and non-integral associates and joint ventures. So this means there will no longer be a category proposed for those uh, association joint ventures that were considered integral uh, and consistent with what was proposed in the exposure draft, the income and expenses on all association joint ventures accounted for using the equity method will be included in the investing category. Now, this is because there was a strong message from users that operating profit should exclude the share of the equity accounted investments because they include income from all of the categories, including the cost of financing and also being on a post tax basis. And that would impact the calculation of a comparable operating profit. So the second major change in the in the investing category is that the income and expenses on cash and cash equivalents will be included in this category, whereas in the exposure draft, it was originally proposed to be included in the financing category. Now, there are arguments on both sides 
for investing or financing for the classification of cash and cash equivalents uh, being a finely uh, balanced arguments. Uh, but in the end, the board has sensitively decided to include in the investing category because it will make the structure simpler by including income and expenses on assets in the investing category where income and expenses on liabilities would be included in the financing category. So that brings us down to the subtotal of profit before financing an income tax, which is intended to allow it, an entity to be evaluated uh, independently of how it's been financed. Uh, this is supported by the financing category. Now, during the redeliberations, the IASB has tentatively decided to revise the approach in the exposure draft for how income and expenses are classified in the financing category. That approach was based on a definition of financing activities. However, the ISB received feedback that there were a number of application questions regarding that definition. So in response, the revised approach, which is described in slide 16, is based on whether a liability arises from a transaction that involves only the raising of financing, in which case all the income and expenses would be classified in the financing category, or whether the transaction involves something other than the reason of financing, in which case only the interest and the effects of changes in interest rates will be classified in the financing category. So the intention of those changes is to make the classification of income and expenses in this category uh, easier to apply. Uh, it's not intended to change uh, any of the classifications that were originally proposed in the exposure draft. Now that said, there is a change within the financing categories, and this is with regards to lease liabilities and payables for goods and services received, uh, as those would now be transactions that include something other than only the raising of financing, and therefore only the interest uh, expenses would be included in the financing category on those liabilities, whereas they would have been considered financing in the old definition. The, the, the consequence of that is that on the interest rates, uh, the interest income or expense, or the change, effects of changes in interest rates will always be in the financing category on those liabilities. And that would mean even for an entity that had financing as a main business activity, such as a bank. So with that as a brief introduction, I'll turn over to Felipe to discuss the key messages that have been heard about those changes to the categories. Thank you, Nick, uh, for your introduction. So um, in general, uh, there was a lot of support for the ISP efforts uh, to address the comments received on the exposure draft particularly on difficult topics such as disclosures by nature when presenting by function. Uh, there was also strong support from users from, for having more structure on the income statement. Uh, however, participants in the roundtables have expressed some concerns. Uh, some of these concerns had already been mentioned in the past. Uh, however, many were also related to the implementation of the revised proposals. We have summarized these concerns in the slides. So for example, participants noted that the proposed categories would have the same labeling as those in the cash flow statement. However, the definitions were different. This could raise some confusion. On the operating category, EFRAG received questions on the classification of specific transactions, such as disposal of businesses. There were also some concerns that some of these transactions would end up being classified in the operate, operating category, uh, even if not part of the entity's main business activities. This is because the operating category is a residual category. Um, participants from the banking industry have also questioned the revised operating category as most of the items that would be presented outside of, of the operating profit would be either immaterial or considered as part of the entity's main business activities. So if we could go to the following slide, please. So on the financing category, EFRAG received positive feedback in the sense that it will help users to understand the performance of the entity, regardless of how it is financed. However, the definition was not always considered clear by participants and there were calls for implementation guidance. There were also participants, uh, particularly from the banking industry, that expressed concerns that interest expenses on lease liabilities could not be reclassified into operating profit. On cash and cash equivalents, some users and preparers highlighted that when companies use a net, net debt concept, the presentation of cash and cash equivalents in the financing category may be more appropriate. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide on uh, associated and joint ventures, please. Uh, so 
On associate and joint ventures, EFRAG received mixed views. Although many participants welcomed the ISB's revised proposals, many, many other participants provided different views on where income and expenses from associates and joint ventures should be presented. Uh, participants had also many questions on whether additional subtotals could be used when associate and joint ventures were considered uh, integral to the business and whether such subtotals would be MPMs. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So, and finally, we have uh, the insurance industry. So, for the insurance, in, the, the insurance industry highlighted that the issue of associates and joint ventures is very important and highlighted the importance of presenting investments that are linked to the insurance contracts within operating profit. So, these were the key messages that we got uh, during the outreach activities, and more details can be found in the slides. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Nick, for, for the introduction. Um, that brings us to our first question, um, which is related to the um, new statement of profit or loss structure. And uh, the ISP has made some changes uh, tentatively to, to the original ED. Um, and my question to my panelists would be whether this improves the usefulness of information um, and also solve the application issues that have been raised during the consultation phase. And maybe, um, Maciej, you want to to cast your views on, on that question. Mache, please. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, um, remembering one of the main goals that uh, we did have uh, of the project and we still have it uh, as a, one of the main goals and objectives is to show um, and improve the communication and the financial statements and increase the comparability. Uh, so, when I read the, uh, read the initial draft, uh, I thought it was addressing it and presenting it uh, much better than it was than before. Uh, but then I looked at the revised uh, form, which is uh, which is shown now, and I think it's uh, improving it. And it's actually more appealing for me than, uh, than the original draft. Uh, I had some doubts in the beginning, uh, in 2020, when I was giving the first uh, opinion, uh, that the uh, subcategory of integral associates and joint ventures would be distinguished. Um, I was thinking about the overall usefulness for everyone, not just for bigger companies or for users and uh, of uh, that that view the financial statements of bigger companies, but also those that uh, prepare small financial statements and those who are reading the smaller financial statements. And it is because uh, I was thinking that the main subtotals that are presented should be those that are very generic and that could be. Uh, shown and presented by everyone, not just some of the entities. Um, so I think that the current proposal maintains a decent level of regulation and uh, is more rigid and the application is more rigid than it was before. Uh, and it significantly increases the comparability, comparability between the financial statements. It is a good step forward uh, to have a precise definition regarding investing and financing um, because it eases up the work for, for the preparers. Um, we'll be talking about it that there are probably some still confusion, but uh, it's better than it was. <laughs> um, I also had some doubts regarding having the operating category as the residual uh, category without uh, any further assistance, especially to uh, the other expense category, uh, which technically is not to be shown, uh, but still can be shown. And it was voiced on some of the meetings that we had before that uh, at least some of the preparers have the um, the concern that uh, the examples shown by uh, ISB and the standard itself uh, are not showing any other expenses. And that may uh, push the auditors and some preparers to not show them at all in the financial statement since it shouldn't be there because that's the impression that they get. Uh, so this is one of the concerns that Kind of, kind of remains on this topic. Um, but overall, I think it does increase uh, the comparability and usefulness of the statement, especially on the financial performance. Thank you. Thank you, Maciej. Um, I think it would also be interesting to get a user's perspective on this, um, because there have also been uh, some of the proposals by the ISB were actually because users wanted a specific format or specific types of information. So maybe, Martin, you give us a perspective from the user side of the equation. 
Thank you, Jens. Yes, definitely. Well, this is really a project that uh, is very beneficial for users. And, and it's really, uh, I think, one of the biggest projects um, out there to really give a push to uh, fundamental analysis for the community. Um, very beneficial. Um, so within this big picture, uh, let's let's have a look at those improvements you you were, that were highlighted, um, and I think uh, it's a really good um, decision of the tentative decision of the ISB to let go of the integral uh, associates and joint ventures uh, for the reasons that uh, Ache already highlighted, and um, because. Uh, an operating profit line item, line item from a user perspective should only include entities controlled and which therefore are, say, fully consolidated. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's the, the big picture. And that big picture should not be distorted by um, results from uh, associates and joint ventures because you want to compare the operating performance of the one company with the operating performance of another company. And uh, and yeah, uh, joint ventures, you don't control. So it's really good that they move one lower. From a valuation perspective, there's another reason. An operating profit multiple is generally a bit lower than a, a net income multiple. So you would want to differentiate your valuation of associates by attaching a higher multiple to those activities, typically than to um, uh, entities valued at operating profit. So there's also a, a, there's a, a valuation dimension to this as well. And uh, so, yeah, it's very positive. Um, and the residual category um, is, is, I think, the practical and only way forward. Uh, and uh, it's um, so your question, um, will it increase the usefulness? Uh, yes and yes. And the ED already did and the improvements uh, do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Martijn. Um, Andreas, a, a perspective from a preparer in the automotive industry maybe uh, will wrap this question up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We have to differentiate, in my opinion. Yes, certainly definition of operating profit is a real uh, improvement. And uh, I think it will work for at least small single companies. But we have strong doubts that as a big company as Volkswagen with different businesses, we have automotive, but we have also financial services, we have leasing business, we have uh, investment property business, we have insurance business and several other things. Um, we do not think that it will work with the business categories, uh, the definitions the ISB brings, it uh, was the definition. Now we have to decide on entity level or reporting entity level what is part of our operating result and what is not and we do not think this will really work for us especially when you bend it for example to our segment reporting it means we are bound how we do our segment reporting if you want uh, realistic numbers think about it we have financial services today as single segments even if it's without in our reporting segments like Trayton which is a listed company, or Porsche AG, which is a listed company. But we may decide in the future that uh, Porsche or Trayton are these segments. Then we would not be allowed for those segments to provide financial services, maybe, as part as uh, uh, show the interest expenses within the uh, COX but show it in the financing uh, um, income. This wouldn't make no sense for us. So totally, we have a big question mark if how we treat as a big company with different uh, with different businesses, how we will define in future which is still operating income and if it may not have a big effect because we are steering companies on operating result. And if that's the operating result of the company, they will not re accept for steering purpose from our side if we say, but it's no operating result on the group level. But maybe we either have to have non-gap measures then, taking that into our results, or on the other hand, um, we would have to uh, take it out on group level 
which really will increase our complexity in steering. So we see that there is some improvement must be done, how to define which is part of our major business activities. Um, one comment on the question two uh, about financial, um, the question, uh, will it fit to every financial institution? We, from our side, see that when a financial institution, uh, the business model of leasing company or a banking company is to raise money, to give it out, to invest it, and those monies you do not need at the moment, you put into co uh, commercial papers, or you put into a cash on hand. And you, this interest must be part of the operating result. To our understanding of the definition today, it is part of the operating result because the business model is always invest unused funds. We had last week a discussion with Daimler. Daimler said, oh, by the definition, they wouldn't read it, that uh, the investing in uh, commercial papers or in cash on hand would still be part of the operating results, they would put the interest down. Then you have a non-meaningful number for steering again, and we would have to adjust it by non-gap measures because nobody would accept at our financial services companies that investing unused funds is not part of their operating result, um, and then it would disturb our steering. That are our major impressions on the group level. Thank you, Jens. Thank you, Andreas. Um, looking at the survey results we just uh, got in, um, a majority thinks uh, the new proposals or the tentative decisions are an improvement, um, but also a, a huge chunk of, of respondents said that uh, further refinements will be needed, although they consider it overall an improvement. And only very few, 4.5% uh, one use effectively, that they, they are not uh, improving at all. Um, the presentation. So I think it's uh, uh, it's a, the right step or step in the right direction. There's still something, you know, some refinements to do. I think, um, as as pointed out by by Andreas, um, in particular, we have heard that feedback in other occasions as well that conglomerates uh, continue to be a challenge in these discussions as well. Um, that brings us to our second question, and that's the revised definition of the financing category. Uh, and Nick and, and Philippe presented that. Um, is that new definition of a financing category now um, easier and clearer to apply? Um, we want consistent applications, so definitions need to be clear. And is the resulting information um, um, useful uh, for users? Um, and also, does it work for banks? And that brings us also to a, another question, which is income and expenses from cash and cash equivalents. Um, is, is presenting them in the investment category as the default category, category the right way forward, um, Nicholas, maybe because we're talking about banks, that's something where you can provide some insights. Thank you. And perhaps it's difficult to just comment on one aspect, so I kind of will comment on several at the same time, I think. I, I first just want to echo what Andreas said. I think he highlighted pretty well my, my, my view as well. We are actually not just a bank, we are, we are a financial convert. Uh, and we also uh, have a, perhaps a different structure than some other banks because we have not an excess of deposits. We have a big mortgage business and lending business. That means that working with a small currency like Swedish Krona, we are dependent on funding in the international markets. So it means that we kind of acquire our raw material that is financing all kinds of currencies and convert them into floating Swedish krona day one, i.e. just financing day one. And then we kind of invest it in commercial papers, might be, but we deposit it at central banks and others. And then after a while, when we have new loans generated, we convert them to, to, to match the, the different kinds of risk that, that new lending uh, imply for us. Uh, the reason for mentioning this is that, if I understand it correctly, the ISB is kind of in their outreach activities, investigating if banks may not have an investing activity, and that's us, actually. We, we provide finance to our clients in all kinds of forms, leasing, lending, or, or, or whatever, and do not really in invest. So it means that, the, as the proposal now is written, 
uh, it implies that we will have a lot of interest expenses outside of operating, uh, and that would not be natural for us. It would not really catch uh, the way we do our business. So, so it, it, it's uh, the accounting policy choice that are there for today in, in the initial proposal for, for banks and others to, to have an accounting policy choice and have all interest expenses and income in operating would be the natural one. Uh, but, but it seems like we would be an outlier there and not been able to present our operating profit in the way that we really uh, believe is the relevant one for, for our, our users. That's kind of the answering that question, Jens. We will come back to, to associates, I guess, or should I? Yes, we do, we do, we do. Yeah. Uh, we come back to, to, to the associates. I think that's worthwhile, a separate topic. Um, but Marisa, uh, if you want to, to cast your views on this question on the financing category as well, the cash equivalent. Uh, thank you. I talk as a user of the financial reporting of uh, many companies. First, I would say that the financing category from most of industrial companies uh, could be a good definition for them. Uh, with the exception of the cash excluded of the financing category, because many companies uh, run their companies on a net debt position. So uh, splitting up what is debt from what is cash and gas equivalents may distort the way they manage the, their excess uh, or their defect uh, monies. Second, uh, I think that the financing category does not fit for financial institutions. From my view, the main difference between a bank and other company is that in a bank, both operating and financial decisions uh, are mixed because uh, bringing in a deposit. What is that? A financing or a operating? So, uh, if you want to split up some of the things where you that uh, generate interest expense below the operating, some of them above the operating, will totally distort the evolution of the uh, of the financial institutions. Furthermore. The overall uh, definition of the operating, in, uh, uh, operating profit uh, does not take into account the specific list of financial institutions. Uh, for instance, they, they mentioned raw materials, they mentioned some items that for banks are really meaningless. However, a key element of the banks, such as cost of risk, is not even mentioned. So, uh, I think it's great having one proposal, one new proposal, but probably one does not fit at all. So uh, I would suggest that may be the case that you have to be aware of some differences, both in the business and in the way they have to present the accounts of different types of businesses, such as conglomerates, uh, financial institutions, etc. That's mine. Thank you very much. Would you mind if I could just come in to clarify the slide uh, that you refer to, which is the, the picture of profit and loss? This is simply an illustrative example for the purpose of this discussion. It's not suggesting that those individual line items would apply to all business models. It's simply to facilitate. So for a bank, we would expect that to look different, not to have raw, raw material costs, for instance. Um, it, it, we, we could show you one which are, was for a bank as well. It's simply for to provide something for this discussion. Um, and, and also for a bank, generally, we are looking to move those items which are inherent to its operations, so interest, up into the operating uh, segment. There are some issues around the edge, which we are discussing and taking views on today. But, but I think it's important to realise that slide is just illustrative of an way these proposals may work, but not the way it would work for all entities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Also, thank you, Marisa. That's helpful. And uh, just a reminder, please use the, the, the survey and polling system to, to cast your views on the uh, questions. We try to keep them as simple as possible, so it's easy to respond to them. And uh, looking on the um, whether the uh, revised financing category definition is clear and easier to apply, it looks a bit uh, different to, the, to, to our first question. 
um, because here uh, there's a, a large majority basically saying it's the, again a step in the right direction, but there are still some clarifications needed. And from what Nicholas and Marisa said, that seems to be a bit of consensus here. Um, and so um, this is certainly something uh, where where any feedback is appreciated. Um, I'm not sure whether any any other panelists have a, a view on, on on these two questions. Otherwise, um, I'll, I'll briefly look in the on the screen. We can move on to the uh, interesting and and also uh, hotly debated topic of um, how to present uh, the results from equity accounted associates and joint ventures. Um, the ISB has tentatively decided uh, that they uh, now uh, they. Uh, um, the, uh, the results from those from from the equity methods that have to be presented outside operating profit, um, and it is um, it, it has been raised by users that it's it's in, in particular important for margin analysis not to see a post tax result gross a net result uh, in the operating profit, and so uh, it's obviously a, a spe very specific and, and special request by users uh, for, for whom we all do this exercise in financial reporting, at least uh, that's what the framework tells us. Um, and so um, a further question on top of that is whether the uh, disaggregation can help to distinct between those that are linked to the main acti business activities and those that are not. And maybe Martin, as, as it's a special user request, that's maybe your opportunity to to further that point. Yeah, hi Jens, yeah. Maybe you can um, uh, allow a prepare first and I can respond to that. I already gave a small hint of my position on this in the introduction. So I think that's Absolutely. probably more fruitful. So, Thank you. I will do. Nicholas, you were already waiting for that question. So maybe you as a, as a preparer can say something. Yes, and I can have, have, have a balanced view and understand that different sectors, it may be differently relevant with the views that Martin will present. So, so from, from a banking perspective, I, I don't really believe that that is the, the right solution for a financial conglomerate. The, 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 the contra arguments that, that we will hear from, from Martin, that, that you need to grasp up the numbers and not present just the net figure, I don't think that's as relevant in banking activities because it's not really a direct link between our input and our output. Looking at mutual funds business, after a certain volume, you don't have any more expenses, just profits. So it's 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 not really comparable with the manufacturing industry. And I have two main concerns, really, and it's related to, I think, some other conglomerates, but, but us especially. especially. If you look in the Swedish market, we, we have two types of, of associates, really. One is infrastructure investments. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the, the big banks in Sweden join forces and build like clearing system, payment systems together. Uh, and if you look back, there are associates because we were just four banks. <laughs> Nowadays, we are a little bit more, more banks, so not all of them are associates anymore, but it's still really the kind of basic raw material or infrastructure to provide our banking services. And we pay commission expense to these entities, but, but then we kind of have a discount in the end in the form of dividend from those entities because they kind of mutual in one respect because they don't really need to do, make any own profits. They, they share that with, with the owners that uses that services. Another thing that I believe might be more common in all sectors, that it's that more and more fintech industry can have excellent skills in certain areas. And instead of the old boring companies trying to replicate what they are doing, they join forces and create associates or joint ventures with them. And they might be accounted for using the equity method. For If you look in the banking sector, for instance, uh, insurance companies like our infrastructure in the form of branch office networks that help them sell insurance products to other banking product, banking customers and so on. And that's really operating business and a, a growing one. And looking at this proposal, we will have that kind of income that is the, in one way the growing income outside of operating. I don't think that is meaningful information for the users. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. So now it's Martin's time to 
<laughs> respond. Oh to wow! I thought I might have a go at another preparer, but happy to go on the on this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nicholas. Um, uh, I still don't agree. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, the the thing is, uh, you you provided a a really uh, a thoughtful example of uh, where your associate is a kind of a supplier to your main business, huh? but you don't control it. Hey, it's out of your control, this associate, because if you were uh, you were controlling the associate, you would have to consolidate it. And it's therefore it is an investment. And typically um, uh, uh, those um, the profits that uh, that come out of that um, are after tax. And I assume that your main business still pays taxes on the profits. So you're mixing up pre-tax results with after-tax results if you were to put them into uh, operating profit, which actually many would argue is damaging your valuation because um, if you want to put a multiple on that, um, it's, uh, people will use a pre-tax multiple on, uh, on all of your activities, which, which is, I think, um, not even in the interest of the valuation of the preparer. And at least it's not in the interest of um, facilitating um, uh, proper valuation uh, methods. So, um, yeah, it's an IFRS, if anything, is so clear. If you don't control, you don't consolidate. And, and, and how beautiful is it that operating profits defined by the IFRS can be linked to the fully consolidated uh, revenues and for financial institutions. Indeed, some practical expedient needs to be made for interest income and expenses, which is underway. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And for one second, I thought you were making a case for proportional consolidation, but uh, <laughs> your final remarks kind of uh, alleviated that. So um, uh, thank you for your response. Um, Marisa, do you have a view on this as well? You're mute. Hello. Uh, sorry, I share partially what Nicholas has said and what Martin has said. First, uh, I totally agree with Martin that you cannot uh, compare uh, things that are pre-tax with things that are post-tax. Usually for industrial companies, you use the operating profit for some multiples, such as EBBDA or EB operating profit. Um, so uh, we should, or uh, my opinion that it's, it's clear, if you take out the, uh, sorry, the, the equity account method earnings, you use that once as peripheral earnings, so making an adjustment on your, on your EV. EV. For banks, it's far more difficult to really define how we use or how we don't use it. Why? Because usually, as I've mentioned in my prior comment, operating and financial decisions are totally mixed up on a financial institution. So uh, probably, uh, the, the, usually, the multiples I use for value in banks are to address in their their performance are more linked to equity multiples. So in the end, I will go to either the bottom line or things like that. So uh, uh, it's, I really believe it's, uh, some of their joint ventures are linked to their own operating business. However, uh, putting it in or out, once it's specified the amount uh, that is in and out, uh, it would make such a difference. Also, uh, um, mainly, well, I follow mainly Spanish banks and some uh, Italian and German banks, but, uh, you know, it's not an item that is so relevant that makes a difference on the operating business. In the end, NII or fake income are the key, or even trading income are the fee, the key fee, the key revenues. So um, it would not make such a difference once I have its uh, differentiate it so I can add it up or take it out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Luca, maybe you, you want to provide a perspective as well on this important point. Yes, thank you very much. I will try to summarize you, not only my position, but also position of uh, uh, working group in which I take part, especially in the Financial European Federation of, of uh, Financial Association. In particular, I would like to 
acknowledge the significant work by, 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 by the, done by the AISP. Um, that has been a challenging task that will be finalized with the collaboration of all stakeholders, the financial community, will in future have more homogeneous, transparent, and comparable financial statement. Um, we consider the definition of main business activity interfaces between investment generating returns from the main business activity is the return generated for the largely independent reserves. For instance, if an entity has a minority stake in another entity throughout a strategic alliance and receives dividends from the later, users will not consider this return as operating income from the main business activity. Users will consider this as a return from investment. In reference to the proposal that requires an entity to provide information about integral associated joint ventures separately from non integral associated joint ventures, as European financial analysts will have different views. Some members believe that introducing integral and not integral associated joint ventures in this special draft reporting entity should be required to systematically provide information in a similar manner, integral and non-integral associated and joint ventures separately. Some other members, however, are of the view that the proposed distinction between integral and non-integral associated will result in highly judgmental uh, choice and will result in a subtotal uh, of little use. Also, some members believe that the assessment of integral associate would be in fact, the only the profitable ones, and the loss-making ones would be considered the non-integral. On the presentation of income and spacing from subsidiary associated joint venture, uh, I, we noted that some member, EISP members, expressed concern about requiring entities with specific main business activity to classify income and spacing from associated and joint ventures accountants for using the equity method in the investing category. Because the last business whose main business activity is to invest in associated and joint ventures, for example, the insurance. Uh, those requiring this income and expense in the investing category will not be reflective of the performance of the FTT. Nevertheless, uh, many EISB members did not support having exception to the general principle of specific industries. Also, between financial analysts, there are part of the members that didn't support exception to the general principle and, and others, including many insurance financial analysts, that would prefer to have a solution in order to be able to have a disclosure in line with the insurance company business model. This expert recognizes, uh, expert in insurance and also banking sector, recognizes that some associated and joint venture investment are strictly linked to the business, and it should be difficult to analyze insurance life portfolio with asset found dedicated to liabilities far if part of this asset result will be separated into investment category. The disclosure solution may be also found in splitting this result into subtotal within the operating profit, useful for insurance financial analysts to understand the business result. This is a possible solution that also we have discussed in our working table and I would like to show you as a possible options. Uh, for sure option. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Luca. Um, maybe a, the view from the from the from the audience effectively is um, there's a, a good 50% majority saying that um, there should be um, there should be a um, a possibility to have uh, those activities if their main activities above the operating profit line. Um, others uh, say it, it's, it should be the default category to have it in investing, but or outside operating profit. Let's put it that way. But in certain narrow circumstances, like you may potentially mention, Luca, uh, insurance business, there might be a room for, room for exceptions. I'm, I'm pretty sure the ISB has has thoughtfully discussed all these 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 concerns. Um, and given that the original proposal actually it introduced or proposed a split between integral and non-integral, I think there was already a discussion on how to properly define it and not that your, your split between integral and non-integral is effectively loss-making is not integral and profit-making is uh, integral. Um, <clears throat> any other comments from the preparers now panel? Because I know this is a, a issue that is very close to, to some 
uh, also from particular industries, but also you know, across the board. So is anyone else a view on this specifically from a preparer's perspective, what, how they would deal if the ISB was to finalize its proposals as it's currently discussed? Volunteers, or is that not the most pressing issue for you? That might also be the case. So um, we have a couple of questions from the audience, actually. And um, well, let's. The first question is um, that we have. I need to to, to find it here yes, in, the, in the chat. Um, is um, why is has the integral non-integral split been abandoned in, as in certain industries the risks are shared and the split would be more appropriate um, and the mining and petrochemical industries mentioned here and that's maybe a, a something for 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 the ISB because um, given that the uh, the proposal was out there in the original ED um, there's certainly the um, maybe a, a reason and more probably many reasons that you have moved away from that. So maybe that's something for clarification as well, why you moved away. So would you, uh, I'm happy to respond to that. Thank you. Um, so uh, in, in a nutshell, we, we had an overwhelming response from our stakeholders, including preparers and users, that this wouldn't be a helpful differentiation between um, integral and non-integral associates and joint ventures. Uh, we heard from a preparer perspective that this would require significant judgment in terms of uh, allotting um, those, uh, uh, those, those uh, investments that fell into those categories into in, um, uh, integral and non-integral, and it would be costly to do so. And in a nutshell, we heard from users that the information wouldn't be useful. Um, and, and so we're not really in the business of asking for information from companies that, that wouldn't be useful, which would cost them to, pro to produce. So it, that, that feedback came very early on in uh, having published uh, the exposure draft. And um, I, I think generally, um, with a few exceptions, it, it remains, it remains the, the consensus feedback on the issue. So um, that's why it was shelved. Thank you, Nick. That's helpful. Um, we have a, a second question, which is in, in a similar vein, uh, which says that why will the legal view prevail over the operational or management perspective, managerial view? Um, um, JVs are defined by legal considerations, while joint op the joint operation criteria might not be met. And um, in risky projects, the, the objective is to share risks, control and revenue, and this will be disregarded in the proposed uh, final uh, uh, rules or, um, or principles. So maybe Omar Tang in, in immediately yeah. raised his hand. So you, you're going to respond. I, I'm very happy to respond to this question. Thank you, uh, uh, whoever asked it. I think it's, it's um, um, there's a bit of a danger in making your primary financial statements depending dependent on a management view because that comes at a huge cost of compatibility. And if, if anything uh, that makes financial statements uh, of the IFRS useful is that it allows, it is, it has a high degree of comparability. So um, uh, proposals that build in um, like optional uh, presentation formats that depend on management view is something to be really, really reluctant uh, with for a standard setter. And and um, and the ISB has a has a good stance so far on on options. And I really wish uh, that that uh, continues. That there are not too many options in how to present based on management view. Thank you. Thank you, Martijn. I think that was a clear message on this point. Um, and it's also interesting to hear from Nick that there's uh, the, the response was uh, quite overwhelming on that point. And I guess um, the, I think that's the, that has been throughout the difficulty while the proposal was well intended, like getting the 
the distinguishing line, the delineation right between what's integral and non-integral is, is challenging. And there will be also some scrutiny and skepticism certain would have been around where people draw their lines. But, I, you know, we hear that the other views um, that some believe they, it should, it's so integral to their business that uh, it should be above the operating profit line. Um, which still leaves us with the problem of uh, having a net number that is post-tax. Um, as I said, this is, I'm trying to avoid having a, a fundamental discussion on reintroducing proportionate consolidation and also um, about uh, the value of the equity method in it in and by itself. So um, there's another uh, question from the audience here, and that is um, um, whether the ISB, given its, its tentative decision so far, um, is expecting that uh, preparers will start using additional MPMs to communicate the operating results, including those, what can, let's call them integral associates and joint ventures. So um, the, the board has recently tentatively agreed uh, what it will call as a specified subtotal. So this isn't a required subtotal, but one which a company could choose to use which would be operating profit plus um, the share of profit loss from equity accounted investments. So, so that could be um, provided uh, and wouldn't be considered to be an MPM and hence the, the uh, disclosure requirements around an MPM wouldn't, wouldn't go with that. I don't think that's quite what the questionnaire is asking for. They're asking for something slightly different. I think my response to that would actually be look at the disclosures that are required under IFRS 12 which users often find are lacking. We were told these are very important associates and joint ventures, but then we go to disclosures around these uh, defined as material uh, associates and joint ventures in IF12. And, and often there's very limited information provided in that respect. So I think there are opportunities and in fact requirements um, uh, within our existing literature to provide better information. And, and I'd say that that's one route to do that. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, any other remarks from our panelists? Um, because we don't have further questions. Oh, there's another question coming in, so hold back. Um, I need to read it first, but I, I'll just read it. Beyond the specific technical solutions you're presenting on the income statement, it seems essential to find total consistency with the presentation of the balance sheet and cash flow statement. And uh, users construct their comparative analysis and financial ratios, uh, ratios from these documents. And it would therefore be essential, in my opinion, to in the audience's or commentator's opinion, to revise not only the income statement, but also the balance sheet and cash flow statements, which is a call for cohesiveness. Um, so I think we've been there 12 years ago. But uh, any view on that on that one as well? Maybe also from the users, how important is that cohesiveness between the primary financial statements? I have uh, Maché and then um, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I was smiling when, when you were reading it uh, because this is something that we actually brought up even as a preparer. Uh, my colleague that was working with me was bringing it up and I, I know you, you had quite a conversation about it. Uh, and I think it's it's crucial to, to bring the, uh, co uh, the, the alignment between the elements to make sure that uh, they are well structured and make sense all together. Uh, but I also understood the, the answer to that, that uh, we need time and we need to close this one up and then move on to the another. Uh, so I think, um, or I hope it will be done, but I understand it takes time. <laughs> Maybe my answer to that. And the ISP has a, a project sitting on their list on cash flow statement, which they might reconsider cohesiveness. To at least with the profit uh, performance statement and the cash flow statement. Um, Martin, you raised your hand as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, excellent question again. I mean, this is something to aspire and to to look for. How can we make uh, cohesive financial statements? Um, there will always be uh, differences. And for example, in the income statement, depreciation is deducted before operating profit. Whereas in in the cash flow statement, no investor would want um, uh, capex to be included in uh, in uh, cash flows from operations. So this is just like conventions, 
And that doesn't mean that this questioner has a point. There is great merit in further aligning and making sure that the aggregations are similar in the cash flow statements and in the income statement so that we better understand the interconnectedness. So, but um, full cohesion is unfortunately, um, I think, impossible. And uh, that doesn't mean that we should somehow aim to see where we can become more cohesive, uh, bring more cohesion to it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Marisa, you always, I also have a view on this. Yes, uh, I totally agree with that question and with the problems uh, that some definitions that we have now, for instance, with the investment category and what Martin has mentioned. And I would also like to mention that we have a fourth financial statement that is the other comprehensive income statement. And from financial institution, that is a huge, uh, uh, a very important uh, um, a statement. There are many, many charges uh, that go directly through equity or through uh, equity plus other comprehensive income. And uh, I think that this is like the all the forgotten statements. So I think that uh, fully reviewing the fourth of them uh, on a kind of uh, in the same direction would be a great improvement for for uh, understanding the evolution or the trends on our company. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that brings us to the end of our first topics, which uh, was the subtotals. And I think we um, to stick to the agenda, uh, we can move on to um, our second topic, which is presenting of operating expenses. And um, we have made a slight change to the structure because we thought it might make more sense, actually, to discuss the presentation of operating expenses and the disclosures on by nature when presenting by function uh, makes more sense to discuss uh, as a package. So uh, we will do that. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Nick presenting the uh, tentative changes the ISP has made. Great, thank you. So as you said, around the expenses by nature, we sort of have two key bits that I like to point out, one around the presentation and one around the disclosures. And so uh, with respect to the presentation uh, of expenses by nature, uh, the exposure draft had, had presented presenting in the statement of profit or loss operating expenses either by nature or by function, and so not mixing that presentation. Uh, however, in response to feedback that this could pre prevent the presentation of useful information and in some cases would require arbitrary allocations of expenses, uh, the ISB has sensitively decided to remove the restriction on that mixed presentation. So the second significant change from the exposure draft is with respect to the disclosures. Uh, and in the exposure draft, it had been proposed that when an entity presented that operating expenses analysis by function in the statement of profit or loss, it would also be required to disclose the operating expenses for the for all of the operating expenses by nature in the notes. Now, feedback from preparers, uh, particularly from some, was that the disclosure uh, would require systems changes that could be prohibitively costly. At the same time, there was feedback from users that the information about the nature of expenses was important for their analysis. So, so in response to the feedback, the ISB conducted further outreach uh, with both preparers and users, uh, seeking to find a solution that achieved a more balanced outcome of, between the cost for preparers and the benefits for the users. Uh, as a result of that work, the ISB has tentatively decided to require an entity to disclose the amounts of depreciation, amortization, and employee benefits included in each line item of the statement of profit or loss. And I believe on the next slide, we have an example of what, what that might look like. So in addition, in addition to the proposal that would look a little bit potentially like what you see on the slide, the ISB is also exploring in this targeted outreach whether this requirement should be extended to include impairments and the write downs of inventories, uh, or whether it should go even further to include all operating expenses disclosed, disclosed in the notes, whether that's through voluntary disclosure or required applying another IFRS accounting standard. Uh, so with that as a brief introduction, I'll turn over to Felipe to, to talk about what we've heard so far. Thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Um, in terms of presentation of operating expenses, 
Uh, many welcome the ISB tentative decision to provide more guidance on the function of expense method and welcome the ISB tentative decision to redraw the prohibition on mixing the methods. However, users and some preparers were not in favor of an unrestricted mixed presentation, as it could lead to cherry picking on the presentation of some line items by nature and impair comparability. Some preparers have also indicated some application concerns. For example, there were questions on the presentation of line items such as restructuring costs, impairment of fixed assets, and interaction with presentation requirements in IFRS 15, 17. If we go to the next slide, please. So in terms of providing disclosures by nature when presenting by function, Users have highlighted the importance of such disclosures to carry out their analysis. However, preparers have provided mixed views, as their preference depends mainly on the IT systems that they currently have. Some prefer the proposals in the ED, while others prefer the revised disclosures. Nonetheless, even those that agreed with the revised disclosures indicated some application challenges. For example, providing expense amounts rather than cost amounts would be challenging for some entities. Um, insurance companies also question how the proposed disclosure requirements would interact with the presentation requirements under uh, IFRS 17. And these were the key messages that we got from uh, the outreach activities and more details can be, uh, can be found in, in the slides. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Nick. Um, let's kick off the discussion because that seems to be one of the more controversial topics, but also where people have dearly held views on. Um, and this has been in particular a issue and a request by users in particular when the primary presentation format for the income statement is by function to get information by nature. So maybe in our time, you can provide the user's view on this one. Yeah. When the ED came out, I mean, there was cheering about this. I mean, the investor community really, really uh, uh, cheered this uh, proposal because it's um, it's much less judgmental. Uh, it provides so much more insight. You can better compare companies between sectors and investing and investment analysis is just all about, uh, not only all about it's it's um, uh, it is comparing between peers and understanding the business model and um, uh, by function it's just so much more judgmental and um, uh, so we really really like the ed so it was a bit of a disappointment to see the board moving away based on um, you know excessive cost of preparers well excessive cost of preparers is of course much more difficult for an investor to to judge whether that is the case or not. But um, I can imagine that if you are on by function, which yeah, okay, um, that it is quite costly to do the entire operation by by na uh, by uh, by nature as well. So um, let's assume for now, for for discussion purposes, that it is excessive excessive cost. Then we have the proposal of the ISB to put in a notes uh, this overview. And to be honest, I was impressed because it is actually, the proposal of the ISB is actually, it kind of reconciliates the by uh, uh, nature to the by function. Uh, and, and that is something that wasn't even there in the, in the original exposure draft. So, um, we do on some key elements, we get an awful lot more insight than the original ED. Is that an improvement? I think it is. Um, so is it enough? No, it's not. Um, this definition should definitely be aligned with how the ISB uh, defines uh, operating profit before depreciation, amortization and spec specified impairments. Uh, so asset write downs, uh, not inventory write downs, but asset write downs and goodwill impairments, they should be allocated as well. Uh, we need we so that that's like an easy one. Now it gets more difficult because 
how can we in the current macroeconomic environment there's a real question about uh, for investors about inflation and about energy cost and there's also no, also sustainability dimension to energy cost so there's like on energy costs i mean any company should monitor its energy cost any company not only for for uh, managing your p l and your business but just for your your global footprint on co2 so um i would advocate that um ultimately uh, energy cost uh should be uh, one of the obliged line items as well um that said it would be a bit strange uh, and to for the ISB to move ahead on energy cost in this proposal without proper alignment with the ISSB on energy. And uh, so for now, and, and, and this is something that will, I think is very important. Uh, uh, we need these improvements, not all in five years. We need them as soon as possible of the entire project. So instead of making it bigger and better, I think we should uh, improve on what is practically possible to improve on, which I think is the impairments um, and the, uh, and the uh, asset write downs, and make sure that we don't, that the ISB does not need to re expose the entire exercise again and, um, and uh, delay the fruits of this project by another one and a half year. So I think. Um, yeah. on the whole, seeing everything, I think <clears throat> with some modification, uh, I think we have to just say yes to it as a user. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you. And that's certainly helpful because there are so, such contrary views from some of the preparers saying it is very difficult. Maybe Maciej, uh, as, as representing a smaller business, you, you provide a view on this as well. Uh, yeah, but my view will be two-sided uh, um, because uh, first of all, um, I represent company that that lives uh, that that works in and, and operates in Poland, and our uh, local gaps are quite different than many uh, because we are uh, we are obligated uh, by local gaps to present the total expenses by function and uh, then total expenses by nature. Um, in, in the notes to the financial statement, uh, if we present by function in the in our profit and loss, so um, I have something like that for my local gap requirement uh, for statistics and, and other things like the specific statistic of X. So um, when I read the original ED, uh, first of all was like, cool, I, I have it for my local, uh, so it's not a lot of work for me. But looking from the group uh, perspective and uh, what we do in a group. Uh, it would be very difficult to set it up in the system if there is a system in place, if the system is working and the system um, didn't offer it. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, groups, uh, especially groups that are uh, just groups of small entities, uh, because most of our entities are quite small, uh, doesn't contain all this information as the big firms they are choosing uh, some of the information that is needed or necessary or, or, or viable for us. And some of them would be very difficult to do. And I, I don't think that many IT systems that are there, uh, that are there and uh, are used can um, uh, be adopted to do what, uh, the do, to do some of the things uh, without a huge cost or, or, or a good implementation and explanation of how to do it. Uh, so I think it takes a lot of time uh, or cost to do it. For, for example, the full matrix that is uh, asked by ISB and they are thinking about it, uh, the, the full matrix of cost by function and by nature and then by function per each light item. I think this is something which is unrealistic, but uh, a, a better approach would be to go back to the original one and getting the uh, full uh, function and then full uh, nature, in my opinion. Uh, the current proposal is like semi for me because, uh, to be honest, I don't have full information regarding it. I will have to uh, make some tweaking to the system to allow showing the costs uh, uh, per, by nature in each per, per, each, per each function line. It is 
achievable. It is definitely less costly than than the other things that we need to do because we already track the, the full cost of uh, um, amortization, depreciation, and employee benefits. But um, I think that some it, it, still, it still requires some work. Um, do I think that uh, we should be showing more? I think it could be it could be a step forward, and it could be good to show. Uh, at least some of the items by nature and uh, that are material for us, that are crucial for our entity. Um, do I think they need to be shown then per each function line? I'm not certain. I, I think that it, sometimes the, the cost that, that, that needs to be done is uh, that, 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 that comes with it is higher than the benefit. I think that the showing the sum is, is enough. Uh, but that's again, I'm coming from quite difficult or uh, specific uh, environment. Um, also, um, regarding the mixture uh, that earlier it was prohibited, I mean, the original draft said that it's prohibited to show the mixture of uh, uh, nature uh, in, in the presenting by function and etc. I I actually don't like the, the amendment. I liked when it was clear and it was separate. I know it creates problems because by function you have this this discussion where you should put and where something should land. But I think it brought more clarity um, to uh, to the financial statement. And uh, I think it, will, it could always be explained in the notes where this weird item, we don't know uh, where it should be in, in, uh, in the presentation by function landed. And I think it would be better. Um, but uh, then again, I, I know I'm in minority in here, so just stating my point and my view. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, I think that the current proposal could be tweaked, moved, amended. But I uh, I fully agree with Martin that we shouldn't and we uh, we shouldn't like postpone the project and we shouldn't uh, or we should avoid uh, just re-deliberating some of the things to make it much longer uh, because the project I think should should move on and should be uh, brought to life uh, ASAP to be honest. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Maciej. Um, uh, representing maybe a view from a larger company and larger group uh, and a conglomerate, Andreas, maybe you have a view on both the mixed question, but also the um, by by nature split if you present by function. So um, I I don't know. I have a view on a mixed uh, approach. We do not follow it um, as a company. Um, sorry, uh, I, it seems to have some problems with the video. I take it out. Um, uh, as a company, we we do not use a mixed approach. We do not see that there is an advantage, at least for us. Um, we are very glad that the RSB decided not to require us presenting by function also to present by nature, because um, this would have meant extremely cost for us. We have about more than 800 companies. We would have to adopt the new systems there. But more important, we acquired, for example, last year Navistar, which is a big group for itself. Uh, it's a US GAP company. We wouldn't uh, expect that they would be able, at the moment we acquired them, to present by nature and by function. And um, so if we acquire a new company, it would really be challenging in time to integrate such a company. Today, it's possible, but challenging. But uh, if they are not prepared to uh, present by, uh, by nature also, it will be really, really challenging. To present single numbers like depreciation, amortization, or um, uh, personal costs by function and nature, um, we already do that. Uh, we split them up in the group, and therefore we know how complicated this it is. It just is for every single number to do so. Because um, it for the single company, it's easy. But if your consolidation, uh, have it in consolidation, you have to make sure that still uh, every item is uh, um, correctly allocated. We do that, this is possible, but it's really complex. So every number we have to split up, not only by function, but also by nature and show where is it uh, allocated by a uh, function, this increases our costs to say that it is possible, but it's complex. Um, 
very important uh, is the question, will it be useful? Um, it was already said, the question is, will it inc really increase the information of the users if we split up um, depreciation, amortization now by nature? Because everybody must be aware that a company normally posts primary costs. So we, for example, have the depreciation amortization for uh, IT costs in the administration cost, for example, because there's the IT center. And then we allocate IT costs to production to, uh, uh, to the other cost centers. And we, but we do not allocate depreciation amortization or we do not allocate personal costs, by, but we uh, allocate IT costs. And therefore, when we later present um, our costs in the administration costs by uh, personal costs or by, um, by depreciation, you may find out that our depreciations, that our staff costs are higher than the costs at all because we have these big allocations. So this must be everybody aware that we only can present primary costs where they are primary posted, but not where they are posted uh, through because uh, we are pushing costs through the whole company. And there, there will be a different uh, situation if you have an owned IT department in production, or if you only have a centralized IT department, it will be a totally different picture. So we can do that, but everybody must be aware that the um, meaning can be really limited. And therefore, um, to come to an end, we would like to be everybody aware it is high cost, limited use from our perspective. So everybody should be aware we should only do that when the real user really say this is really necessary for them for analyzing. Because otherwise, we will only have high costs uh, checking those numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Um, Luca, because it's the fingers pointed at the users, maybe you want to respond as well. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. And I, I tried to, to summarize the, the, the point of view. And the starting point about uh, uh, the, the, the per function presentation is that uh, it is an, an analytical information created uh, with its own specific company information, assumption like uh, cost allocation process, which always uh, differs from one company to the other. There is no single definition of cost of goods sold. We note that the ASB uh, special draft doesn't even try to give a proper definition. So uh, how we can compare two companies uh, reporting by function? Comparing the, uh, the understanding to cost uh, of goods sold of gross margin is too difficult and many be very misleading. This company specific cost of goods sold is very often the most important by far a component of operating cost, preventing any serious understanding of the cost structure of the company and this change over time. And the other line that is closed in the function profit and loss, like marketing cost, research and development cost, are the free choice of entity. Their comparability is low. In a per nature presentation, this aggregation is much better. As you can see by number of lines for operating expense in, in the example provided at the ESB, and it allows a, a much better forecasting basis, a key point for users. The uh, per nature presentation also allows a much better comparability between companies where depreciation is depreciation a major improvement and a major goal for primary financial statement project. It should be a major goal for international standard set. If a company has a per nature disclosure, the link with the cash flow statement is strong and does, does exist uh, with a per function presentation. The current uh, mini disclosure depreciation, amortization, and employees' cost in the ESB last, last, last proposal 
breaking down only these two costs, and each function is no practical use for a financial analyst. As we will have only a part of the picture, it will be impossible to make a healable analysis and conclusion. Just imagine that you have some operating cost capitalized. They will disappear in depreciation, but uh, who will know why they are included in this amount and how they are spread in each function line? Lastly, per function disclosure will offer no links with all the non-financial information that is to come in the next years. This information will only be conciliable with the penetrating information. For example, how can you accept to reconcile the energy cost? As previous Martin has said, the energy cost is very important for us in this moment. Energy cost data in a per, per function presentation. The per nature disclosure has been requested by user for more than 20 years as one of the most important pieces of information, allowing us to better understand the performance and increasing comparability a predicted PBT. Uh, with this current latest proposal, it's still not there what we have. Uh, uh, done in our common lenters and what we uh, ask in other contribution over more than the last 20 years. But uh, I, I like to, uh, to, 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 to support the improvement uh, in, in try to increase the note, in try to increase this comparability. I also agree that there are uh, different information for different sectors, but it's important to have a monogenous information in, in, a, in each sector to be able to, to compare this, uh, this data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Um, we have, in the meantime, asked two questions. One question on whether mixed presentation is um, or allowing mixed presentation or not prohibiting it, I should say, is is, is the way forward. Um, I think there is there was strong support for that. Um, the picture is a bit mixed on um, on providing um, nature information if you present uh, your income statement by function. Um, obviously, it, there is a majority um, saying it's still too costly to apply, um, and we have heard some of the reasons that might lead uh, lead the audience to that answer. Um, it's also we also see uh, but a good support at least one one quarter of respondents say yes we think this is a, a sensible compromise um, to, to work with and um, as we hear I think um, there is a very strong user voice at the moment we have heard from our time but also from from Luca on that that at least some of, of the nature information is relevant uh, if you present by function because that makes you know the overall financial analysis easier. So I think there's uh, there's certainly it will be difficult uh, for the ISB uh, um, to to completely make everyone happy. But sometimes you know it's uh, the objective is to make uh, people sl uh, less unhappy <laughs> overall and. Uh, reach a, um, a consensus on this, um, given the strong user voice and asking for that information. I think it, practically we have heard that it's getting more complicated, in particular if you if, if the systems calculating the standard costs are decoupled from the financial accounting systems, and if you have um, um, diverse groups with different potential systems where the, the standard costs are carried, and then you know they have to pull them up in, in consolidation. and. Um, coming from a jurisdiction uh, that has used to traditionally report by nature and then because uh, that what the market forces told them to and uh, be comp comp uh, compatible to uh, other entities in their industry they moved to by function presentation it was not 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 that easy back then um, <clears throat> so uh, we have and Martin has briefly touched on that point and maybe we can explain a bit. Um, you touched on impairments, but also there is a question on uh, uh, write downs of inventories that should be presented um, uh, or disclosed. And Martin, maybe you can explain a bit on that as well why this is important for users. Yeah, <clears throat> well, the uh, th this is all about uh, this actually hooks into cohesiveness because 
The, the other part of the project that we did not touch on in this presentation is the definition of operating profits before depreciation, amortization uh, and impair impairments. Um, uh, this year, or last year, I think, the ISB decided to improve this definition to also exclude um, asset write-downs and impairments, for example, of goodwill. So, um, and this is really uh, something that all analysts, when they try to come up with a own version of EBDA, do. And um, uh, so it's it's really, I'm really glad that the board listened carefully to this uh, market request. And uh, so EBDA, it obdi, it's the new obdi, <laughs> we better get used to it. <laughs> um, it's the new EBDA, and it's a really valid starting point. Well, uh, obviously, the same logic why OBDI is in there, um, uh, it, the, these impairments and, um, and asset write-downs need to be, um, be reconciliated to the by nature um, presentation uh, if a company reports by function. So these two should be aligned. Uh, and and um, that's just a very natural uh, reason. Uh, so maybe others can add into this as well. Thanks. Thank you, Martijn. Um, any other views on that specific point? Or strong feelings? Um, from the automotive section, we didn't understand the question at all uh, why we should present write downs on inventories, um, naturally because they are in the Cox, but uh, it's then a lot of the discussions that others may see it in the other operating income. And if it's only about uh, saying where we show the write on on inventories or mainly show the write on on in inventories, it's no big thing for us. We just write it in the Cox and then, then we're gone through. That's no problem. Thank you, Andreas. To be honest, the same. Oh, sorry. Jay, no, no, sorry. Please. It's the same for, for us. We just showed them in the operating category. So, you know, showing it up it wouldn't really change much, to be honest. Thank you. Um, we have two questions from the audience, which I would like to bring in. The first question is that um, uh, the worry that the proposal to permit a mixed presentation would require additional disclosures on depreciation may be unduly onerous for smaller companies, and this may uh, in turn impact the quality of the information provided, um, and thus impairing comparability, and is that being considered from a cost-benefit perspective? Maybe that's a question more to the ISB, I presume. So I'm happy to come in there. Um, I, I mean, the first thing is, um, the, the proposal is to permit mixed presentation, not to impose. So I, I'm not sure how that 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 results in extra cost for an entity. In some respects, you may say it could reduce cost if, if an entity is already using um, a mixed approach because they wouldn't be forced to go one way or another. Um, in, in terms of the, I mean, the reason why the ISB has has um, looked at additional disclosures around depreciation, amortization, and employee benefits. Uh, those are the three items that I, by, night, I, uh, by nature um, preparer is already required to disclose uh, in IS-1. So um, all that is additional is, is looking at the allocation of those into the functions. Now, we hear a lot about today about connectivity between um, sustainability-related uh, disclosures and financial statements. It doesn't seem um, really against that background too much to add to uh, to ask for connectivity between what's in the notes and what's on the face of the financial statements. So to try and build that connectivity, to have better connectivity, um, and so that's where we that's why we've landed on those. It is a compromise. The solution we we could pursue what was in the ED, but this would this would certainly add. Um, some years to the project, and I think the, the judgment of the board was to try and find a compromise and see if we could move forward in a timely manage manner with the proposals that we already have, rather than rather than delay further. 
Thank you, Nick. Maciej, you wanted to react. Yeah, just to say that um, I understand, uh, but there is a difference. Uh, the way that companies could enter it into, this, into their accounting system is, is various, uh, especially amortization is usually just brought up from, from another system that, does, that deals with fixed assets. So bringing some of the information that is required now by IAS is one takes a different time, cost and burden on especially the small companies than uh, then by distinguishing it further by the function as well, as, uh, again. So I do think it is a cost and it, it depends on the company, how they enter, because some are using tagging, some are using just different um, ways of, of summing this cost up. So for some companies, it may be just just a note. For some, it may be actually a, 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 do, uh, a huge cost to, 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 I mean, comparing to the size, because again, uh, we're talking, the question was about the small companies. So looking from the small company perspective, it does take some, some time to dig it in and change it uh, all up in the system to allow the, um, the parallel function line, uh, which will, would be required nowadays. Um, will it impact the quality? I think it increases the quality uh, because the work needs to be done, to be honest. Um, it, burns, it, it, it carries the cost, uh, which is to be discussed. Uh, is it a significant in, increase in quality? I have my doubts whether just showing those two or three items per function does increase in quali the, the quality so much that it's necessary to, inc to, 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 to show it. But um, then maybe users have different opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Maciej. Any of the users having a view on this? Otherwise, just looking at the... the otherwise, I have a question on... Um, Energy costs, and obvious, for obvious reasons, this is a a, a, a hot topic at the moment. Um, and the question is, how would analysts compare two entities of the same industry, one with a highly integrated production and transport, uh, so uh, energy costs being a primary expense, and the other one is the externalizing um, products in that respect, and hence energy costs are included in the cost uh, of goods purchased and transport service charged by third parties, and um, maybe one of the users can shed some light on this. Maybe, Martin, you want to? Yeah, sure. Come in. Well, this is, for example, for airlines, this is a very hot topic. I mean, the age of your fleet the, can decide your competitiveness. Um, and uh, for shipping, for example, um, it's, it's not only, I mean, financial analysis is migrating not only um, is, is more and more and more including sustainability uh, aspects of companies as well. How viable are you in the future? And um, will you be able to um, uh, live up to the societal needs uh, that, um, that, that, that are imposed uh, on you, sometimes by taxes or prohibition? Uh, so um, it's not only like um, how does this cost uh, raised by X percent because of the energy mix of a company. It's also about, oh, you're dependent on, on heavy uh, fuel for your ships. Um, uh, how, how competitive will that uh, be uh, over time? Um, and so it's, it's um, uh, and it's bringing the pieces together of the puzzle. That's the whole life of an analyst. And we need clues for that. And energy costs are a major clue for that. Um, and um, it's, it would be like the, an exemplary of how sustainability information presented in a management report is, can be linked or should be linked um, uh, to um, uh, energy costs presented in the financial statements. So it's, I think this is a this is very important, um, and it's probably investors will choose to engage on with companies if they observe um, uh, uh, levels of energy costs that they are worried about, and discuss that as part of a strategic uh, dialogue with management. 
uh, on how what kind of company they want to be in five years from now and what kind of programs they have in place uh, to maybe alleviate or uh, change the energy mix. So it's, there's and so an energy cost in the PNL is one of the key clues there, which would be very beneficial for us to have. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's, that's certainly a helpful answer. There's another question from the audience. And uh, oh, and Andreas, please, because you want to respond. Sorry, I wanted to respond on this question about energy um, from a preparer's perspective. I understand it from a user's point of view in the first side that you want to know what our uh, our energy costs are, but like it was uh, lined out in the question, the problem is you have different companies and if I only get a cut, uh, uh, um, um, if I only have expenses by external parties, um, it's not my energy costs, it's my energy costs if it, I do it by myself. And what is my energy costs? We are self-producing energy. What is my energy cost? Is it total, uh, total cost of uh, our, our energy providing? Or is it only part, for example, the part of gas we uh, uh, acquire or the coal we acquire? So as long as it's not defined, you have a less comparability. This is a really complex question, I will say. And if we do not um, have more discussion on, uh, about it, how we can define it, you will have a total different outcome per, per company and it will not be really comparable. And I just quickly respond because I, these are very valid uh, comments, Andreas. And it's it's about say scope one or scope two, huh? And and uh, on on carbon footprint, it's very similar. Uh, the thing is, if you buy stuff from others, you have a choice. You can choose to buy from somebody else who has a different energy mix. You have much more flexibility than when your machines, it, it, they are your machines that you are feeding with uh, whatever, uh, diesel or electricity. So um, uh, from a flexibility point of view, there is a difference. So um, even when you, when you ask me, how do you compare these uh, two companies with a very different, uh, say, outsourcing or um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, you have more flexibility as management if you choose uh, to attract your services from another company. So there's less dependency, I would argue. Uh, you have less dependency, but you will not see it at energy costs. If I only get an invoice for transportation, and you even will not see if we, for example, invest more in CNG uh, uh, transportation instead of normal uh, diesel transportation, you will not see it in our energy costs. That's uh, the point. Actually, we will because of the CSRD, and the CSRD uh, will require you to um, uh, to uh, look up and down your supply chain, um, especially scope two here. Uh, so this is information that may seep in via the, su the sustainability report that is uh, bound to become uh, a obligatory uh, reporting requirement when the effective date is there. Okay. It will take away of the bit of the leeway um, in in make or buy decisions because you have to present scope th uh, three potentially going forward anyway. So, um, Luca, you have raised your hand as well. Yes, thank you. It's just uh, one more uh, one more topics that, that in my point of view is important uh, regarding the energy cost, but also other similar important costs like HR costs. What is important for us is, is to know what, what is internal and, and external split in the strategic investment of the company. Because if the company have a, a in more internal uh, process in production with more internal energy costs, less external, uh, the company the group can manage better this kind of risk and, and also is more clear in terms of uh, um, impact in terms of ESG impact because the, the company can or the group can, can manage better this uh, 
uh, this important uh, asset in Tanasia. If they are external asset, I understand it's difficult to have this uh, split in this information for a group is impossible, but there's also a, a, a higher risk in terms of to, to manage this important part uh, in, uh, in the business process, uh, this important part of the cost in the business process. So that uh, in our point of view, this information is also useful uh, uh, because we can have a, a clear picture of the strategy of the company, if, uh, if the strategy is aligned with the cost or not aligned with the cost in terms of internal uh, resource or external resource. So that not only for energy, but also in terms of, uh, for example, HR, that is another important also element for the ESG, uh, ESG information, not only for financial information. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. And I think we still have one question um, uh, left, which is the question about whether to include all operating expenses disclosed in the note. But before we move on to that, um, we still have a polling question uh, on the inclusion of impairments and write downs of inventories. Um, and there's a, a majority supporting the inclusion, um, but there's also a strong minority saying you should you shouldn't include either of them into into the income statement. Um, so um, dearly held views, I presume, uh, on on this one as well. But a slight majority for in, including them in the disclosure and the income statement. Um, so we have a, another question, which is and, and another proposal by the ISB, which is including all other operating expenses to be disclosed in the notes. And uh, maybe Andreas, uh, you have a view on that because that's also a new requirement, if you wish compared to the original EV? Um, yes, what well, is really important for us, not saying others. Uh, it would be really uh, good if we go by, um, uh, sorry, uh, by disclosure, by disclosure and decide this is really necessary for the user to know it because every disclosure we add will really add our costs. So this is um, really important. As I mentioned out, when you provide this data, it's not just splitting up your accounts and saying, okay, can you split up the different uh, items, but you really need um, to reconcile that uh, group internally. It's a lot of costs, it's really complex, and therefore we would uh, appreciate if it's only done when there's really usefulness. And we, as a preparer, don't really understand what the usefulness is to split up every cost uh, item by uh, function. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, Luca, do you want to react to that? Yes, yes, thank you. As we as we already have, have introduced before, uh, we, we we are supporting the presentation of operating cost based on the function of expense, but we think the presentation better by nature of the expense provide a more useful understanding of the actual operating cost of an entity. A by nature presentation provide more disaggregated breakdown and more information of the operating cost in the, of the operation. In a function basic presentation, in many cases, the cost of good can represent a high percentage of the total operating cost, which provides little information of the actual cost allocation. An entity presenting its expenses on the by function basis should also present a full reconciliation by the nature. Um, we, we welcome the special draft requirement the, um, with this option. We, we, so that in, in few, we, we, we prefer the disclosure by natural presentation, but uh, uh, that, that doesn't mean that we are completing against the, the by function presentation. Because it is true that uh, the profit and loft often doesn't contain enough information to properly analyze the cost structure. And the way that is uh, that, that this has evolved during the lifetime. For example, the marketing cost. Uh, this is often the case when by function is used also uh, when by nature is used. It means that the users in both cases want better information in the notes that give more details referring to the operating cost. We have checked, we have checked a few good and a few very poor examples in, 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 in the market. In terms of comparability, I've observed that the sector by function 
probably uh, are better used the by function because it, Perfect the sector business model, the, the core business model in each sector. If that is the case, uh, that uh, uh, I, I think for comparability sector reasons, it is better to accept the by function presentation as it allows uh, us to compare companies. Having say that if the compare the, the cost of sale of a couple of retail companies, you must admit that they uh, all and the different definition of what cost of sales specifically is. So again, the, it, it's better use the notes with good level of disaggregation. It is very important for us. Uh, for another point, we check uh, the few annual report and several companies that had a by function presentation in profit and loss and, uh, and also have a by natural presentation in the notes. It seemed uh, quite uh, helpful for, for us as users. Some companies did that better than others, but nevertheless, the extra information in the notes seemed quite useful. What about a mixed presentation? We cannot see uh, why we would be against that. It would allow each company to give more details when needed. Um, and uh, we ask uh, only for one condition. If they uh, mix the presentation, uh, it, it is important to have a, a sufficient disaggregation available in the notes to be able to compare the two cost structure. Finally, uh, we like also not, not to be negative about the, the functional information. If uh, this is uh, more in line with the business model, uh, the sector business model, but uh, we, I, I stress that uh, uh, we need the better comments in the node on the cost structure and the comparison between the, 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 the two cost disclosure if we have uh, both uh, the, the by function and the by natural information. So it, this is, is a summary. For example, if there are some local uh, jurisdiction in, in which it is uh, necessary to produce or by nature or by function in a specific sector. And I, I personally am an insurance uh, uh, analyst. I, I use uh, in, in, some, in some local jurisdiction some very interesting details that are provided for, 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 for specific sectors so that uh, I, I, I can continue to use uh, this information if uh, it is uh, available. Uh, I, I think it's a useful both in some situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our topic number three. And um, I'm just owing you the result of question, the polling question number nine. So I think we'll wait a second until it pops up. And um, do we have that? Just looking at the board here. Let's wait a second, otherwise, there you go. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> there is a, um, let's say, strong majority against disclosing all other amounts of expenses by nature uh, with nearly 88%. Um, so um, only one respondent being in favor of it. Um, so that's a very clear response from the audience. Um, so with just, that- just, uh, just to clarify, if I could- Sorry. Say, this, Sorry, yeah, sorry, Nick, Nick, uh, uh, this, this, this isn't a proposal that the board has tentatively agreed. This is an area that, that we are exploring throughout which. Yeah. And so it's um, just to, uh, if there are concerns out there to, and, and <coughs> see the message uh, in the slide. Thank you. You're testing the waters effectively. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, your, your microphone is yeah, muted. No, no. Just noticed, thank you. Um, this brings us to our next topic, which is uh, management performance measures. Um, and the, both the rebuttable presumption that the ISB has introduced during its deliberations, but also the, uh, the a simplified approach to the required tax reconciliation. And 
Um, Nick and Felipe, maybe you guide us through the recent proposals on this one. Sure. So as the other sections, I'll kick us off. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the, those are the two main changes to the management performance measures disclosures. So the addition of a rebuttable presumption and the, and some guidance on calculating the tax on reconciling items. So in the exposure draft, um, there was a proposed definition for capturing a subset of non-GAAP measures that will be disclosed in the notes, including this reconciliation uh, and other information to give transparency about about on our management performance measures. Now, part of the definition of what a management performance is, is that it communicates management's, as management's view of an aspect of the entity's financial performance. And part of the definition is that it is communicated in public communications outside the financial statements. So the rebuttable presumption is attempting to address feedback that in that definition, whether a measurement, whether a measure represents management's view on its own, could be subjective and therefore lead to management performance measures not being captured within the definition. Uh, but also there's feedback that not everything that is communicated in a management's public communications necessarily reflect management's view. So, so to try and address those two, the rebuttable presumption uh, is that if a measure is communicated in an entity's public communications, it's assumed that it reflects management's view. Now that can be rebutted with reasonable supportable evidence that the entity has published that information for reasons other than communicating management's view. An example of that might be that measure is not something that management feels reflects its view, but it's something that is required to publish by, by regulatory guidance. So the other change on the next slide relates to the calculating the tax on the reconciling items. So in the exposure draft, uh, the requirement that is proposed is to include the effects of the income tax and the non-controlling interest on each line item reconciling the management performance measure to the, the closest uh, comparable measure in IFRS standards. Now, there was feedback that, that it can be complex to calculate the tax effects on an individual line item. And so to address that, the IASB has tensively decided to include this guidance on how the tax is calculated. And what it does is it introduces a simplified calculation that would be based on the statutory rate of the underlying transactions in the relevant jurisdictions, uh, but it also would allow for more complex calculations where an entity wished to do so. So again, this is a change that's trying to attempt to find a balance between providing useful information to, us to users, giving that minimum level of information, while balancing the cost of repairs and providing it. So, so with that, uh, turn it over to Felipe to talk about the, um, the feedback received so far. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Nick, for the introduction again. So on MPMs, FRAG received also some application questions, particularly from uh, financial institutions and also some references to the scope. Uh, for example, participants question to what extent additional subtotals would be permitted and whether they would be, uh, be considered as MPMs or specified subtotals. There were also questions on MPMs related to non-listed entities, including how would it apply to subsidiaries that have a parent that makes public communications. On the rebuttable presumption, uh, many welcome the new rebuttable presumption on MPMs. However, there were questions on whether an entity would have to provide disclosures when it, it decides to rebut the presumption that a subtotal is a, an MPM. Highly regulated entities also raised questions on the applicability of the rebuttable presumption. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, on the revised uh, simplified, uh, simplified approach to calculating the tax uh, effect, EFRA got mixed views on the proposed simplifications. Uh, some welcomed the ISB simplifications as it would remove a large part of the operational complexity. Others consider that calculations were difficult, even with simplifications. These participants requested additional guidance to help implementation, such as illustrative examples. In regard to disclosures on each reconciling item, some highlighted that it can be challenging and asked whether it could be done at subtotal level instead. So these were the main uh, comments that we got in, in the outreach activities. Thank you. Philippe and Nick. Um, <clears throat> I think we start with the first question, and uh, that is the new rebuttable presumption that uh, you know if you use if you use a certain certain MPMs in outside financial uh, financial community or in outside communication, 
then uh, it's considered an MPM unless you can actually rebut it. Um, and the question is, will that actually work in practice? We have heard through comments in, in that this might be an issue in highly regulated industries, and I think that's an excellent jump-off point for me to hand over to, to Nicholas on this. Thank you, Jens. Uh, and I was glad over the wording that Nick used here to say, if regulation, it may be rebutted. Because when I read the staff papers previously, it had been law. So, so, so that kind of had my been my input when, when reading that I think that regulated entities, for instance, banks have pillar three requirements. That's ex extremely extensive extra reporting requirements. And the insurance industry, they, they need to publish their OSHA, their own risk and solvency assessment that contains a lot of data. And when I initially read what was suggested, it, it was law and not regulation. So, so if it's easy to rebut based also on regulation, not just by law, I would be really happy with the proposals because that's really my, my fear in this. But, but you also have some information that I feel that we provide just because of the stock exchanges require it, even though it may not be fully relevant. <laughs> so it also may be kind of a, a, a contractual requirement to publish certain information that not necessarily is our own view of our performance. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Marisa, do you have a view on, on this as well? Yes, I agree with uh, what Nicholas has said. Uh, for financial institutions, we have, uh, uh, in Spain at least, four different uh, income statements. One that goes for uh, the banking associations, other that uh, comes to the CNMB, other one that uh, they, if they are quoted in the States, they, they have to use US GAAP, and then they have their own release. So we have many different accounts with some different criteria. And I would say that assuming that uh, a management performance measure is uh, what appears in a profit loss account and it's linked to how really the company uh, addresses or values or um, values uh, the performance of their own people, I don't think it should be a, a good idea. I think that basically, even the name uh, may be a bit misleading because accounting is not made for all this. Accounting is fairly uh, uh, try to make things more comparable within companies, but you cannot force companies to manage companies with these criteria. So I think there are many things that uh, really uh, we, we should take into account. Uh, First of all, I would change the name. Instead of management performance measures, I would call them performance measures uh, that uh, would uh, use companies to be compared, not probably uh, banks or other companies inside do not use those measures. Furthermore, uh, they give us the, f the, the full information in a fully consolidated basis. And when you have 300 subsidiaries all around the world, it's impossible that you really measure the performance of your manager by some uh, uh, accounting criteria that is used for comparable purposes. And in the end, uh, we have, uh, as also Nicholas has mentioned, we have Pillar 3 we ha in the banks, and we have many things, uh, and uh, be having to be reviewed in every single thing uh, that they have to present. It would be a, a total nightmare. Thank you, Marisa. Um, Andreas, a view from, from a conglomerate on, on this one as well. Um, yes, um, we are very glad about the clarification of the um, reputable presumption, especially when I think about our financial services uh, companies, which are regulated. Um, and it must be suddenly clear that when our companies, our subgroups present numbers on their own, that that is not a few of the group. That is something we are still bothering a little bit about, how uh, narrow this definition is. I think we understand what the ISP wants, and we totally agree with what it wants, but we still fear that the uh, interpretation later may be broader than the original point of view. So we would ask the ISP really to look on the wording 
that it is really narrow, that is really clear defined what is meant with the MPMs, who is, for example, responsible. Management is a broad approach. We think it must be key management personnel only and something like that. So, so it's about more where we worry, it's about wording and not about what the RSP expect us, us to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking in another user voice, maybe Martin, you have a, a view on that as well. Yeah, the, when the ED came out, um, we actually were had the same concerns as Nicolas and, uh, and uh, Andreas. So we, we also highlighted that regulatory information uh, purely uh, presented for regulatory purposes should not be reconciled. I mean, we don't even want it. Huh? It's not that we, we oh, please, uh, if you can. No, no. I mean, can you imagine that all those figures of ba of, from, from Basel and, and 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 uh were to be reconciled i mean that would be an overload of uh meaning meaningless information so we were very keen on how the isp was going to improve on this and i think um what um, it's it's a little bit more difficult for me to judge whether this indeed um uh cuts out sufficiently um but uh to me it seems like pretty much spot on um, and I don't worry about too much about the the name management performance measure. Uh, I think it would work for me. Um, it's just how you define it that will ultimately decide whether it will uh, work or not. And it, the, the name NPM is just the name. Um, um, so uh, I did like the comment about non-public entities um non-public entities can still have debt outstanding and uh actually there there are quite a few non-public entities that have issued debt so i do see and not necessarily do those companies all have um uh open websites uh, where you can publicly sift through so there indeed is a component there that uh, I hope the ISB will solve. Um, so, um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And I think we already got also some feedback from the from the audience on the um, on the uh, question that has been raised um, on, on this one. And this largely broad support for having the rebuttable presumption, but the 50% of want more application guidance on how it can be rebutted as, as would be expected um, because uh, usually the threshold for rebutting something is pretty high so people want to know how to rebut something <clears throat> instead of relying on interpretations by auditors and potentially regulators so uh, it's my presumption so better resolve it in the standard but uh, martin you have your rest your hand please yeah just to add i mean um i i totally agree that oral communication should be excluded I mean, uh, when many investors have dialogues with companies and you don't want to completely lock that up, uh, that uh, a company cannot, you know, it has to complete, com continuously stick to whatever was in the press release uh, in the financial report um, uh, for the communication. Uh, so it's uh, there, I think the, the quite substantial stuff is excluded and it's excluded validly. I mean, that's also in the interest of users that uh, not too much is covered by the rebuttable presumption. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I think one of the or the next question is on one topic that we have discussed at EFRAC and uh, also other uh, um, circles and, and committees and groups quite heavily. And this is the requirement to present um, all the MPMs on a uh, to, or to to split out the tax effect, and um, the ISP got some feedback on on the more detailed route where it would have to do it uh, split out the tax effect, and they have proposed a simplified regime for that. Um, and that brings me to my question: uh, Is that a good compromise um, in terms of cost, but also does it still um, 
still uh, satisfy users' needs in that respect because they have been specifically asking they need the tax information in the reconciliation on that was plus uh, the non-controlling interest, obviously, but I think uh, the tax uh, was more, the tax effect was more debated on this one. So, um, Matai, while, while you add it, maybe you can give it a go on this yeah. question. Sure. I mean, this um, the whole topic of NCI is something that is a bit overlooked in IFRS. Let's face it. These are, are companies that are fully fully controlled, they're uh, controlled, they're controlled, and they're fully consolidated. And they could be economically owned for 30%. And they, they could be owned for uh, 99%, uh, but they're, fully con they're all fully consolidated. And investors in general, even IFRS 12, does not really uh, help us a lot in um, unpacking what the effect of those entities that are uh, the, the parts of the entities that are not control, uh, that are not owned, what those effects are on the group as a whole. And this is like a first good inroad, or no, not the first. It's an additional inroad in better understanding how uh, certain items affect uh, are affected by um, uh, NCI and the taxes. So. Do we need that behind the comma? Actually, we don't. So um, uh, we need the information, but uh, um, we're, we're open to practical experience to make it less costly for preparers to put up with. There will always be cost, obviously, but um, uh, I'm glad that the uh, ISB found a way to formulate practical experience that would relieve um, uh, a significant amount of cost for the preparer because yeah that's uh, this should get us where we want thank you um, Andreas obviously the preparers uh, raised their voice in terms of the cost of preparing that information and maybe you have a view and whether the simplified approach might be uh, striking the right balance yeah, for me, it has a lot of to do with the quality of the standard at the end, because normally we we as a company has a philosophy to provide operating profit as a main item. And later we had the diesel issue, and then we had some NPMs on that, which are strictly limited. If it's about that, what we have to present, I understand that the user said they want the effect on a restructuring or on a specific fine. We say we take it out of, from the operating result because otherwise it would be misleading. Um, that they say I want the tax effect on it because fines can have a tax effect of zero. This is a major difference. Or I want to know how it's split up. You're a big group. How it's split up? Is it Trayton or is it Porsche? Where we have uh, uh, high uh, NCIs. I fully understand that. But then we uh, talk about the new approach, and I'm not sure if we can still keep operating profit as our major um, um, controlling item only on minor items like maybe investment property somewhere or maybe some interest costs or something like that. And then it can be said we have really slightly differences, but split up totally to our group and then providing this additional information for, let's say, a slightly modified operating profit is totally overkill, remembering that the operating profit itself is not shown tax effect on it or NCI effect on it. So we wonder why should we show it now on this slightly different um, operating profit we may have to present to show our view of the operating business. That's what we do not understand. And the cost will be really high because at the end, I have to have a different posting on it, on the um, tax effect. And I have to invite a totally new uh, way to uh, show NCIs because today every consolidation system I know goes at the top uh, at the bottom line and then calculates NCIs. I now have to calculate NCIs on different uh, items within the profit and loss statement. This is a totally no, new concept to us, which will be really challenging, challenging 
and cost intensive to uh, apply. So it really has to do with the company, what do I expect as an MPM? Um, today, only operating profit plus minor effects, no problem. But if I want to have a slightly different operating result, then it will be really, really complex to, to follow your approach. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you. And that's uh, for a, a big company, maybe Maché, for, for an SME, how, how's that? Was that feeling? Um, <laughs> well, I I really like the change of the approach and the and and simplifying it. Uh, and while I'm a smaller entity, we still have the problem of being a part of special economic zones, and uh, we actually get a very specific tax tax discount and tax exemption. And my main concern was that it is very difficult, extremely difficult to show it per each line item if I need really to dig it in, because the way we calculated the tax and the tax exemption is um, almost unbounded from how we calculate the, the profit and loss. So doing it per each item that we would reconcile in the NPM measures would be extremely difficult. So using the simplified method and being able to apply some kind of a prorated would be still applicable, makes sense, uh, but simplified. Uh, then, then just dig it in and trying to figure it out is much way better than than and it was in originality. So, um, definitely a good step for step forward for for special economic zones. <laughs> and those all tax tax exemptions, of course. Thank you, Maciej. I unmuted the wrong mic, so that's why I had an echo. Um, it looks like the right path forward, I think, on, on this one, although still not not to everyone's pleasure. Um, that brings us, we already touched upon reconciling items, and this um, um, is, is, is an issue that, that we have raised as an additional question. Is it still feasible amount uh, to relate the amounts um, related to each line item um, in the statement of financial performance? And um, maybe, Marisa, you have a view. Uh, from a user's perspective, how important that reconciliation is for you? Uh, uh, myself, as a user, uh, I would like everything uh, as uh, as much speed as the better. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, the cost for the company. So, uh, although I would really like reconciliation, why? Because then I can match different uh, management performance measures of different companies. So to compare them, uh, the problem would be the cost. So uh, I guess that probably we can find out a middle in the way solution. So not to have a very to increase much the cost of companies, mainly for the, the small ones, and to make in some of the management performance measures also comparable uh, with other companies. If we do not, not have reconciliation, it's, uh, it's uh, very difficult for us to really compare uh, the different management performance measures from one company to the other. Thank, Thank you, you, Marisa. Um, Martin, do you have a view as well on reconciliations? Unless, well, except for you, the more the better. Uh, no, uh, uh, my initial take was uh, we, we don't want too much. But when they are there, we want them to be comp complete as much. Uh, so uh, I, the reconciliation, I can, I mean, all companies that will be reporting EBITDA in the future will need to reconciliate it to OPDI. And I can assure you that all fundamental analysts will just spell every word of this reconciliation. This is like critical information for the investor, critical, because we, this allows us to make our own judgment, uh, to recompense, to, to make our own judgment about what we consider uh, either underlying or continuing or uh, um, EBIT uh, opti for the firm. So this is very insightful. And I don't believe too much in the cost of these <coughs> reconciliation because these are deviations that management make themselves. So, I mean, the, <laughs> those are the reconciliation of management themselves. Where do they come from somewhere? They, so it should be obvious what those deviations are because you created them yourself. 
how can it be costly to show them in the financial statements except for the ink? Um, it's I don't see the problem there. Um, and it is will be of a very high, um, uh, these sections will be spelled by investors because it, uh, it doesn't mean that, and I really want to make this clear, I like companies to produce NPMs. I want to know the view of the company and how it deviates from IFRS. That is useful information. I would encourage companies to produce NPMs. But please explain in detail how you, uh, what exactly the deviations are so we can, as investors, make our own judgments as well. So this is the real, uh, this is a major improvement from where we are today. And um, yeah, uh, I hope it will be implemented without too much delay. Thank you, Martijn. Um, that was uh, a, a robust statement on, on having these reconciliations. Um, maybe we have a, a prepared perspective on that as well. Mache, um, is it just the ink or is there is there uh, something else? <laughs> well, um, it, it really depends on the company, I'd say. Um, I think in many, in, in at least in some companies, it shouldn't be that difficult to pull up if we have it uh, prepared for the MPMs or whatever you would call them. Maybe they, they're, they're not MPMs, but some measures that we do take into account. Um, at least I'm not a public company, so, you know, uh, the technique, I don't have MPMs. Um, but overall, um, I'd say it's very entity specific and it, mostly concerns about how the entity would run the accounting uh, system, I'd say. Um, my main concerns don't lie in getting the information. My main concern lies in how useful it is. So I, will, I, I wanted to say it's, it's up to the users to say, and I think that the users stated their mind. Um, <clears throat> I, I always think that we need to have the good balance between a low amount of information uh, and uh, uh, and what we show and we what what we decide not to show to not overflow uh, the financial statements with stuff that that doesn't necessarily need to be there uh, because what I always try to say when I'm at university is like when you have 300 pages of information you you can't read it all so we just we need to try to be cohesive and and, and quick and and short uh, to ensure that the, it, it's it's a good piece of information that we receive not not something that is not necessarily needed to be there. Thank you, Maciej. And the, the beauty of, of having that as a requirement is also that it becomes audited. And uh, so, um, so maybe there's an additional cost to only the ink, which is the additional audit fee um, for the reconciliation, for auditing the reconciliation. Um, thank you very much for your responses on, on, on this part. I think we still have a, a, a question, or we had a question on the um, simplified method of calculating the tax effect on the reconciling items. I think there was a, a majority saying it's a good compromise so far for both users and preparers. Um, although we have one third of the respondents say that it's um, it does not sufficiently reduce the costliness of preparing the information. And I think this is certainly something uh, worth noting. Um, I presume this, these responses are mainly from preparers on, on this end. Um, but um, it will be difficult. And I think it has been mentioned that the cost of providing the uh, that additional information and also the tax effect on the simplified method also depends on how you currently run your, calc your reconciliations and also your calculating your tax effects, um, which might be different throughout. Um, I think we have space for one uh, question from the audience here um, uh, that, is, that has come up and uh, it, it asks, I think the complexity is on the NCI and tax impact, not so much on the primary reconciliation items. I think that's a fair statement. But could the, the analysts in the group explain why the tax and NCI impacts of the reconciliation items are so important? Um, um, and it is a reference is made to Andreas, um, who said that it, the key is operating profit uh, before income tax. Um, so maybe Martin, you're smiling. Maybe you want to respond. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> investors uh, don't receive operating profits as a dividend. 
uh, they, I mean, there's still taxes out there and there's uh, financing costs. And uh, so um, if you want to understand the cash flows of the companies, it goes beyond uh, having a good uh, look at operating income. Hey, and you want to model, uh, you need to model tax uh, as well. So these disclosures uh, allow you for better judgments in um, estimating uh, current and future uh, tax uh, expenses. So maybe that's a short um, answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Martijn. And the other, there's another question, and I think that might be one for the ISB. Um, <clears throat> on the slide deck, it is mentioned that um, extending MPMs to ratios, cash flows, et cetera, um, has been also requested by some. Um, um, but um, it, it so far has been dismissed uh, by the ISB. And is that something you, you want to add or you consider it? You say we need to keep the project focused. Um, to go over the come over the finishing line in in the near future, so maybe comment maybe yes. from you well Nick. Sure. absolutely so so this was a a strong request that we heard not only from users but also from some preparers, and I believe it was included in the efrag 's comment letter, also the proposal um, i Our concern was that this would represent a significant uh, expansion of scope and could actually, again, slow down the progress of the, the projects by a meaningful uh, period. Uh, we are requiring disclosures where um, items which relate to the statement of financial performance, where they are subtotals of uh, income and, and expenses, are included in the ratios. Those would be required. Um, but we, we have chosen not to extend um, this to balance sheet and cash flow measures. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we do have a project which will uh, initiate at some stage um, on the cash flow statements following um, feedback from users. The one, the one thing, I'd, I, the final thing I'd say here is we have been asked um, by some companies which are concerned about duplication of their non-IFRS measures, whether they could include these in the financial statements. And I think at the moment we are having a careful stance of neither permitting nor prohibit neither explicitly prohibiting nor uh, sorry permitting or prohibiting so i think that will be an area of judgment if um that's where companies seek to go um we, we do see it in some financial statements already today so i suspect it's an issue which is more for local jurisdictions and regulators in those jurisdictions thank you very much nick um martin you have raised your hand so yeah, happy to comment. Uh, I, I, I sympathize, sympathize with the idea of um, getting these reconciliations out for amounts in the cash flow statement and, uh, and financial position. Uh, but I do agree. Uh, I think the uh, I do agree that it should not delay the project. Um, uh, and my fear is that it would well delay the project if we ask for that right now. And the good news, there is a, a project on cash flow coming up as well. So it could well be that the NPM then is expanded into uh, the cash flow statement as well. I do not support um, NPMs on ratios. I think it will lead to a, a huge amount of additional reconciliations, which are like obvious because um, ratios tend to be based on amounts <laughs> and uh, the amounts should be reconciled. So um, I think we get sufficient uh, information from the amounts and um, and uh, we have to be careful. We, let's first see how this works out in practice uh, before really enlarging the scope to ratios and other stuff, I think, and, and get the project done. That's uh, the, maybe the biggest message. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe and do not do the well, the original primary financial statements project back back at well, one and a half decades ago. Maybe did uh, 
and was too ambitious to resolve all issues around primary financial statements and make everything cohesive, uh, which then was maybe a bit over ambitious in the end. And not to say that it derailed the project, but at one point you need to say you have to take it in chunks. I think that might be also worthwhile here mentioning this. Um, thank you so much for, for this. Um, and I think it's time to move on to our last topic. Um, this one we're discussing uh, something where the ISP has said we will not uh, do something in, in that area. And uh, this is unusual income and expenses. And uh, obviously, this was certainly a topic that is that was designed and maybe uh, uh, prejudiced to be um, to be controversial, and it, it showed it, it was. So, um, so I think uh, Nick and Felipe, you can briefly introduce what the ISP has decided so far. Yeah, thank you. I think those are great introductory comments. That's that's absolutely right. And I think what we've just been talking about, about mission focus for getting things done as quickly as possible, also factored very heavily into the ISB's decision on this one. So as you'll know, there was a, a proposal in the exposure draft to have a definition of unusual income and expenses, requisite disclosures attached to that. Uh, and, and while there was feedback that, that it was well supported to have a definition of unusual income and expenses, it... Uh, the definition that was proposed based around a, uh, an idea of recurrence um, was not well supported, uh, mainly because of concerns around the subjectivity of that definition, uh, but also the population that it was capturing was not considered to be to be the right one. And uh, the, the board and, and the staff did, did a lot of work around trying to resolve those, those issues uh, through many discussions and, uh, with stakeholders and, and within the teams. Uh, but ultimately, uh, what was emerging was that what, what stakeholders were after was more of a definition that included not only recurrence, but also some other quality that was being very difficult to define. And it became apparent that trying to define that or pin down that definition it was going to take a significant amount of time. And so ultimately, the board has decided not to proceed with the, with, with pursuing that definition, as we've talked about just, just recently uh, in the in the interests of pr pr um, moving forward with the project more quickly. Uh, it was noted that although this proposal has specifically has been withdrawn. Some of the things we've talked about with what management performance measures will capture and some of the proposals around dis disaggregation will capture some of the information that would have been uh, captured under under the definition and, and the requirements for unusual income and expenses. Um, but but again, ultimately staying focused on, on delivering as quickly as possible, the board has withdrawn this proposal. Um, so I'll maybe turn it over to Felipe to, to talk about what we've heard so far about that. Yes, so in terms of our uh, outreach activities, uh, many uh, many participants, particularly preparers, uh, welcome the ISP decision to redraw the requirement uh, to define and disclose information on unusual income and expenses, uh, as there is no consensus on what it is. However, in general, users disagreed with the ISP tentative decision on unusual items, as it is important, important to, to have more transparency and discipline on the use of unusual items or non-recurring items in the financial statements. So I, I think this was uh, these were the main comments that we got. Thank you both. Um, I guess nearly everyone has a view on this, um, so um, I'll try to, to pick one uh, who's starting on, starting off. And maybe Ajay, you have a view on unusual items and what to do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so um, I was actually the one uh, that that actually liked the idea of introducing it, introducing it to the standard. And I actually regret that it's it's not a part, but I understand why and i understand the need to to go out and and, and publish the standard uh, my main concern regarding the lack of disclosures in relation to unusual incomes and uh, and expenses arise from from local grounds and what i see that happens a lot which is the just ticking a list of requirements to fulfill um i understand the view uh, that uh, the the risk of not disclosing it may be mitigated by by other rec disclosure requirements that are present in the in the proposal Proposal. But uh, on the other side, I'm afraid that there will be companies uh, that just may not disclose 
uh, this information, even if it's uh, uh, if, if it's material, because they all just um, bound it together with something that is more usual, and 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 therefore uh, we may just lose out on some information. Uh, I've seen that happening in the past, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that keeps happening in the future. Um, so I understand the problem. Uh, I understand the problem of the definition because it, it was very difficult to give a good one. Um, so my only only thing here would be that um, I'm hoping that it will be a part of some future project, and uh, I understand it, it it will not be moved on now, but uh, that it should be a point of discussion at some point in the future, and uh, something regarding this area should uh, be published and should be enforced. Um, that's my most uh, um, strong point of view on that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. Maciej. Uh, Martin, a user perspective on unusual. Yeah, this is actually what we would really like to know. What is unusual and uh, have them identified and so we can have our own judgment. Um, it is so difficult to define. So whatever definition you come up with, it will just not fit all preparers. And um, this, the, the good thing is, the NPM, uh, many companies produce NPMs to explain why their underlying result is different from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, their other normal result. And, and the NPM, the NPM uh, reconciliation will give us already so much. The, so I think um, the IFRS foregoing on defining unusual uh, will have a limited impact on ultimately how much insight we get because of the strong language on NPMs. There's one area of concern that remains because companies uh, elaborate on all the unusual costs usually, but they, not, they do not always elaborate too much on their unusual incomes. And so there's uh, a bit of concern like, okay, is there maybe another way of maybe putting in some extra safeguards on especially other income um, that to make sure that we understand other income? Um, because it can be very substantial for companies and it can vary greatly over time. <coughs> and um, it's very difficult for an analyst to to put a view on, okay, should I just take it out as one off but, uh, without proper disclosures on other income. And um, so I think if there is something to do, it's on providing more um, uh, a little bit more disaggregation on other income, especially because there, there's the real concern. Other expenses will be will be uh, like exceptional expenses, unusual, will be highlighted by management anyway. Um, and whatever the solution is, it should not delay the project. Thank you. That seems to be a recurring item that it shouldn't delay the project. Um, so, uh, Luca, you, you have a view as well. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, the view is a similar with other uh, speakers in the sense that uh, as users, we consider an expense unusual, for instance, when arising exceptionally, in particular, here from an expected environmental contingency. But uh, on the other hand, uh, an entity incurring in either exceptional marketing expense due to launching or post a marketing campaign will not be considered an unusual expense as a part of regular business activity of an entity. Users adjust the entity valuation when it, it, it's occurred exceptionally. Uh, and in particular, uh, is it, uh, uh, when when regarding the presentation of, of unusually items in the financial state, we think that introducing a separate line uh, item might increase the risk of impairing comparability among companies and might involve element of subjectivity. 
removing ambiguity and making comparison may for be key for an innocent investor. So that uh, I, I agree with the person I agree with the decision of the ESB to postpone this uh, um, this this topic. And and then uh, last uh, last information: unusual income and expenses can be explained in notes. And if there are other items that impact on the operating income, the entity should be explicitly reporting this information also in the notes. It should eliminate the disclosing restructuring costs and income of other natural operating expenses and disclosing these notes. So that I think that the solution is is possible. Uh, as option for information that uh, the, the company that like to give information is not, but I agree with the ESB decision to postpone this this, uh, this matter, this topic uh, to the future, because uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this framework, as it was presented, it was not uh, uh, not clear uh, how, how to apply, and also not clear uh, for us as user how to read this, how to analyze this kind of information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Um, Nicholas, unusual items in the financial services industry. Yeah, and, and what's really that? It's a difficult question. But, but just to, 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 to start from the beginning, I, I, I fully agree with ISP not trying to come up with a definition since I was part of the debate back then in my and I had your role, Jens. Uh, I think everyone agrees that it might be good information, but no one agrees on the definition. And lo looking at, at the banking industry, the users I I'm involved with, I think their main focus is not really unusual items. It's to kind of identify the recurring earnings. So, so regardless if it's unusual things or not, they, they want to be informed of how much have FX movements affected your expenses and, and, and all kinds of things that are not really unusual, but, but recurring, but still distort the, the kind of long-term expected earnings that we will generate. So, so that kind of information we give already, regard, regardless if it occurs every year or every second year and so on, because they, they want to kind of find the basic earnings that we have uh, and the change in, in that. So, so, so I agree with not trying to do anything right now, and I don't think they should try to do anything in the future either. <laughs> so so, so I'm, I, I'm okay with that. They withdraw it. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, Andreas, from a corporate perspective. I totally um, uh, agree to Nicholas because we present the numbers relevant already in the MDNA um, when we discuss it, says, and it's not relevant for us. It's if it's an unusual item or if it's in currency effect, for example, which brings up the big deviation. I do not agree that we do not show extra, extra or unusual effects in the income. We also show that because when you have a tax on one billion of one big one-off, you have to command that. That's no way around today. So um, I do not see that there is any use in a, in the concept presented by the ISP today. The only thing, when we go further, then it's discussion going back to extraordinary items, because then you can put it out from the normal ordinary uh, P&L and separate it. This would be maybe a, a better way because then you can separate these extraordinary items. We had a lot of discussions when you had the diesel, diesel issue, and we had to explain where all the unusual items are within the PNL and light out which line items was affected. Then you have a um, big advantage, but uh, only to line out some items, and the others I have to, uh, to line out too, because if it's not unusual, but if in, it's affecting my uh, numbers, I have to explain it. So there's no really use for the concept. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. And uh, just for, for completeness sake, also in the audience, there's, there's strong support for the ISB dropping that um, with a notable mention that um, that also some ask for a bit of, of a backstop in terms of what cannot be labeled as unusual in any way. Um, and we have seen that in the past, uh, you know, that there's a tendency to label expenses as unusual. Um, never income. Um, so I think that brings us to the end. Um, um, originally, Carmen wanted to um, uh, to to give 
to to close up and close out this meeting and, and make some final remarks. But she has been she had to evacuate her office because there was a fire alarm. Yeah. So, um, um, so I'll I'll wrap it up and also in the interest of time I'll try to keep it keep it short. Um, so okay. my main takeaways are I think the the ISB is making good progress uh, in terms of uh, reaching a consensus and I think we in a good world we would take all the time in the world to to finesse everything but I think I also hear a strong tendency of saying let's get it done for the for the moment and avoid any you know re-exposure and further delaying the project. Um, and do not uh, you know, search for the holy grail here, but you know be pragmatic about some issues, um, and you know defer some of some remaining issues into other projects potentially where they can be or hopefully will be resolved. Um, I, I take away that some some elements of the subtotal discussion, in particular on the equity accounted investments, um, but also on presenting by function and by nature and disclosing by nature items, is still where there is a lot of discussion. Um, and I think I can also fairly say that, uh, you know, dropping the unusual definition, although we would love to have seen it, but, you know, um, it, it is difficult. I think it's also there's broad consensus, I think, that this is uh, acceptable given the progress being made on the project overall, yet uh, this to avoid derailing it for, for, for a, a, a small element of it. And so um, in, in in summary, I think we're making progress, and um, if everyone is a bit unhappy but largely happy, I think that's uh, where the, the sweet spot is <laughs> to to get to, to finalize a standard. And um, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, first of all, to my panelists here uh, for for making for making yourself available and, and contributing to this. Um, I should also uh, thank the ISB for us, for being around and also. Uh, conducting all these outreach activities uh, to, together with EFRAC and other uh, standard setters and organizations, and, and I think it's 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 most helpful. But I know it's, it's it can be very intense to have all these meetings and get all these diverse feedback. So uh, thank you very much also for attending today and the other meetings. Um, obviously, also to the EFRAC Secretariat for organizing and and putting this 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 targeted outreach up in, um, in standard setting terms very a short time short time frame. Uh, and, and last but not least, it's it's the audience, you guys participating uh, today in the webinar for listening in and providing your views via the polling questions. And uh, uh, please feel free to reach out either to the ISB or to, to EFREC if you have any specific additional comments you want to raise. And uh, with that, um, I'm not sure, but I don't think we need to hand back to the Secretariat. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, this brings our webinar to the close, and uh, I'll speak to you, as to you all of you in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.